Well, welcome everybody. Hello. Uh, this is the December 17th Sandag Board of Directors meeting. It is 9 a.m. and this is our last meeting of 2021. Uh, we have had all of our meetings virtual in 2021, um, but I just wanted to share that I've been talking with the executive director and the staff at Sandag and the board leadership about coming back into in-person meetings um, in the beginning of the year. We're talking about the end of January right now. Um, and so we'll be reaching out with some more information about that, but I wanted to just share with you my perspective that um, I think our agency would be better functioning in terms of board. We have a, a lot of disharmony in many ways, and I think our board would be better functioning if we were to be a person and talk to other face to face, and also to have all those intangibles, communications with staff, with the public, um, so get, getting back to having some uh, in-person board meetings, I think is important. And I also just want to recognize that um, I know that for some, this will be more of a burden because you'll have to travel there. So, and I'm one of those people who has to travel somewhat across the county to get to the board meeting as well. But I think that given the benefits of it, it is something that we really need to work toward toward getting back uh, to that. So, um, so there'll be some outreach from the executive director and staff about it, but I wanted to just put it on everybody's horizon to be thinking about um, and, and preparing yourselves for. So with that, I'd like to ask Carlos to introduce himself um, and walk us through our translation services. Thank you, Chair Blakespear. Uh, we'll begin with the announcement in Spanish and I will be back with the announcement in English. Muy buenos días y bienvenidos, bienvenidas a esta sesión de la mesa directiva de Sandag. Se está ofreciendo interpretación simultánea para hacer uso del servicio. Simplemente desplácese a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen sus controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación, parece un globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish o Español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom en celular, tableta, etc., presione primero los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Por último, si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio o Silenciar Audio Original. Good morning once again. Uh, we do have interpretation available. In the event that there are any comments or questions in Spanish, we invite you to take advantage of the feature. To do so, please scroll down to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are, click on the interpretation icon, it looks like a little world, and then select English as your language. If you are joining through the Zoom mobile app on a cell phone, tablet, or other mobile device, first press the ellipsis, the three dots, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Gracias and thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I would like to invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Um, now I'd like to welcome alternate mayor Pro Tem Spriggs from Imperial Beach who's joining us today. Um, and I don't think we have any other alternates. If we do, please pipe up right now. I don't see any other alternates. Um, and I want to recognize our port commissioner, Benelli. So there are some people in this county who have been around a long time and have been contributing for many, many years in many, many different roles. Um, and and um, Benelli, um, our port commissioner Benelli, who is the chair of the military working group, is one of those people. So he is headed off into a well-deserved retirement. And um, I just wanted to say a little bit about him. So he served 45 years of active and reserve service at the US Naval Special Warfare Command, headquartered in Coronado. He also served the region as the director of communications here at Sandag and as vice president of communications and vice president of military affairs for the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce for 25 years. So in 2014, Chair Benelli was sworn into the board of the port commissioners to represent the city of Coronado. And Sandag is very grateful for Chair Benelli's dedication and commitment to not just the military working group, but the entire San Diego region throughout his career. And I'll say that when I first joined the Sandag board, he would sometimes pipe up and offer his wisdom and perspective on, a long, on the, the long context of a decision. And I always found that to be very valuable. So I wanted to just really thank um, Gary Benelli for all of his service and his contributions here. And I'd like to ask you if you wanted to say any words here. Thank you, Chair. This is, you, this is a surprise to me and the, the accolades have been coming in all, all week. Uh, 
just thank you very much. Uh, it's been a 45 year association with this great organization. Uh, councils of governments throughout the United States vary in scope and responsibility and governance. Uh, I'm just uh, very, very uh, supportive, very, very biased for those of you who put yourself through the trial of being an elected official, raising money and asking people for votes to come and leave your jurisdiction and provide a regional perspective, connecting the dots. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. Merry Christmas, happy holidays to all of you and continued success. Well, thank you, Chair Vanelli. And we're, we're, we're very grateful for all of your service and we hope that you very much enjoy your retirement. <laughs> okay, so now moving on, um, just as, as an update about public comment. So the instructions for providing public comment are on the cover page of today's agenda. And it, just as a reminder, in order to allocate the speaking time most effectively, um, we are requesting that if you would like to provide live public comment, either raise your hand on Zoom or press star nine on your telephone, but it, you should do that at the beginning of the item and you must do it no later than the end of the staff presentation on the item. So that means that it, um, you can't raise your hand while public comment is in the middle and then um, expect to be called on because we, we need to know how many there are so that we can allocate the right amount of time. So just as an explanation of how that works uh, and a reminder. So we're gonna, going to start with our non-agenda public comment, and then we'll take non-agenda member comment at the end of the agenda, and we'll also hold Hassan's CEO report for our next meeting. So if you would like to make non-agenda public comment, please put up your hand now. And I'll ask Francesca to take it from here. Thank you, Chair. I do see five hands up from the public now. Uh Six got one sixth person just got in just in time. Um, so uh, I'll start with Mike Bullock, who will be followed by Nathan Schmidt. And Mike, you can go ahead when you're ready. Well, thank you very much. Uh, honorable board, uh, good morning and uh, congratulations on uh, proving a uh, very wonderful visionary uh, regional transportation plan. Um, I'm gonna start with a quote that I've used before and it's a quote from uh, our then governor, uh, Jerry Brown, and he was talking to the Pope and he knew this was gonna be uh, quoted in the newspapers. And he said that um, humanity must reverse course or face extinction. Um, those seven words are important and we should keep those words in mind. And he was not kidding and that was not a scare tactic, that was just the truth. Um, at the last meeting, I believe in one of my speeches, I said that uh, human survival requires climate stabilization. And I think that's, uh, you know, two fewer words in that. That's actually a better statement because it raises the question, what is climate stabilization? Um, it's pretty important, isn't it? If, if human survival requires it, then, then it's pretty important. Uh, now I wanna talk about, uh, what appeared in the UT on December 10th, uh, the article, we support Sandag's new plan, but not just its road usage charge. And I'm gonna say a little bit about the road usage charge again, but the thing is, I wanna point out that nowhere in that statement is there any words about climate change? Absolutely nothing. Unless you know, sustainable appears in there, that word sustainable. That's really not good enough. You know, our general public is confused about climate change. They don't understand how serious it is. They're fearful, but they're not really knowledgeable. And it's your job to, you know, if you're gonna have a long article about a regional transportation plan, and the fact is cars emit the most greenhouse gas, and the fact is we, our first climate stabilizing target is in 2030, and you should all know that you're elected officials. You should be focused on the details of climate change. And so this article should say, uh, point out the, the connections there. That's a responsibility that you have. Um, and of course, the, um, the gas tax has to go. The and, and no one wants a road use charge that doesn't want to have it replace the state gas tax. We have a state road use charge replacing this, the gas tax. The gas tax is inherently unfair. 
It's the exact same rate for a destitute driver as it is for a billionaire driver. And let's face it, most billionaire drivers are driving electric cars. They don't pay any tax. It's not equitable. Social equity requires that we be realistic about that issue. We need a road use. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Nathan Schmidt, who will be followed by Catherine Rhodes. Nathan, you can go ahead. Nathan, you're self-muted at the moment. If you can open up your mic, you can go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and move on to Catherine Rhodes while Nathan is figuring out technical stuff. Um, Catherine, you can go ahead. Sounds wonderful. This is Catherine Rhodes. And first, I wanted to say I saw the um, an agenda item from earlier in December, and it said that you guys were looking at the port headquarters building for a possible um, for a possible location for the central mobility hub. I think that is fabulous. Um, you actually said that it was, you know, a superior alternative than the alternatives you have before, and I agree. I actually brought it up to you back in 2019 about it. And one thing I want to um, mention before, you know, before when I used to come to Sand Egg, you guys would always say that you can't use airport revenue for mitigation offsite the airport. But with your um, new chairman came in and actually said, yes, you're going to get 500 million for offsite um, mitigation from the airport, which is huge. Um, but the only thing is that money that um, you're looking at is only. 55% of the revenue that comes in. They're saying you can only use concession revenue, parking revenue, and non-airport related revenue. But the thing is, if um, a, a great solution and a, a way to fund your, your, your full central mobility hub would be for um, the airport authority to annex the port site. You just literally annex across Pacific Highway to the port site and maybe surrounding areas. And then that is considered airport property. And then instead of using only 55% of the, the funding available for, for your central mobility hub, you can fund 100% of it because it would be on airport property and the FAA would say it would be okay. And so that's what I would like you guys to um, look at when you're looking for looking at the um, central mobility hub. Actually look and see if you can annex the land and then the land would be considered airport property. And then the FAA airport revenue restrictions would no longer apply. And this way you could get 100% financing for your project. Um, you know, you're talking about how you can get new revenue sources coming into you. Um, the airport has literally hoarded all our funding for all these years, for decades and decades. They said that they can't do any offsite mitigation. They've been hoarding their funds so much that they're so rich. This richness of our public tidelands belongs to all of us. So um, if you guys have people on the airport authority and they, they don't want to do it, try to get new people on the airport authority that would actually do that because, um, you know, the, then we could have all that money associated with it. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'm going to come back to Nathan Schmidt. You can go ahead. Uh, Nathan will be followed by Lori Saldana. All right. I'm sorry. I'm not sure, Nathan, what's going on with your microphone, but I'm going to go ahead and move on, and I'll try to reach out to you separately to get your comments. Uh, so I'll move on to Lori Saldana, who will be followed by uh, Kina Tian. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, I wanted to ask a question and if, if staff could follow up, I would appreciate it regarding the regional energy working group. Uh, there are a lot of important projects taking place related to developing local energy. And yet I, it appears that the working group has not convened a regular meeting since September 2020. And so I, I'm not sure if it's, it's still an active group. I certainly hope so, because there are a few things as essential to our success as a regional planning organization, or, or for your success, as having people consider where energy will be generated, uh, how it will be distributed, uh, how it will be priced. And um, there, there's a, a necessity to have this 
being uh, worked on to have clean and locally generated energy installed often as part of other major infrastructure projects. So when there's already uh, construction taking place, uh, that's the perfect time to look at things like solar generating panels. And uh, as someone who has served in the state legislature when we were passing uh, some of the country's first climate change legislation and has uh, worked to ensure that we have affordable energy for people because uh, utility costs are one of the big drivers of uh, people losing their housing when they can't pay their, their rent as well as their utility bills. San Diego pays the highest per kilowatt hour energy rates in the state of California. So we have uh, a real need to have more affordable energy, cleaner energy and locally generated energy. And yet the Regional Energy Working Group um, hasn't been conducting business for quite some time. So if it's possible for staff to uh, get back to me, I think I had to put my email address into this chat. I would really appreciate uh, a chance to learn more about uh, what is going on with, with this working group and if meetings are planned to begin sometime in the near future. Um, finally, I would suggest partnering with uh, any company that can install solar energy panels and looking for ways to put those over areas around the trolley line. As it expands along uh, major throughways, those are excellent locations to add energy generation infrastructure. Uh, it will provide shade, it will uh, already be in a disturbed area. And uh, to me, any project initiated by Sandag should have an energy generation component to have more distributed photovoltaic power, uh, both to operate the, the facilities on site and also to put into the energy grid to help with our uh, resource adequacy needs. So um, thank you and I hope that group meets soon. Chair, that concludes the public comments. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, oh, no, thank you. Um, okay, that concludes public comments. I just wanted to comment on the last commenter's comments. So um, I would like staff to get back to her about the schedule. You know, Sandag is not involved, as a transportation agency, we're not involved in every single topic happening in this county, although sometimes it can seem that way. Um, and I know that the staff is going to be recommending uh, culling some of the working groups. We have a large number of them. Some of them have not met frequently or, or really produced anything uh, in terms of work product that's of merit so um, recently. So I think we're gonna be um, considering some changes in that area, but um, I would like to make sure staff gets back to her because she's clearly following this topic and would like to know what Sandex doing about it. Uh, we'll do. So thank you. Is, that, is that Hassan? Yes, we'll do. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Um, so thank you to the public comments today to the public for commenting today. Uh, so if we move on to our consent items, I just wanted to mention a note that Supervisor Anderson um, did not attend the December 3rd meeting. So we need to make that correction um, in the minutes. And other than that, I also wanted to ask if Supervisor Lawson Reamer had any comments she wanted to make about item six. I don't see her popping in, but I do see supervise. I do see a uh, mayor hall. Okay. Um, go ahead, mayor hall. Yes. Um, I do have some questions on this one. And I think you summed it up best in your last statement is Sandag is looked at to be <clears throat> doing many, many things within this area. And I just wonder, is this a path we really want to start down? Um, I think each of us, um, have our housing groups. And I mean, we all need housing money. And I mean, you know, if there's working relationships, I think we as cities are capable of working those out amongst ourselves. I don't see the real need for Sandag to be involved in this. And we're just starting out another path, another committee. And, uh, and you know, I just have real questions about why are we doing this? Are you gonna have access to monies that we, the cities do not? Yeah, actually, if I may, Chair Blackspear, Mayor Hall, yes, we do have access to money through the governor's REAP budget. Um, we got some housing money. We also have, if you recall before, an incentive program, housing program, and the County of San Diego 
have a desire to partner with, with us. So we do have resources. We, we think it's legitimate to make it available for our member cities uh, with the housing program. So uh, if we didn't have the money, we wouldn't even be talking about this, but we do have resources that you'd like to make significant incentive program uh, like uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles did uh, before. And, and that also gives the region the ability to access more housing money, which we really need in San Diego. So okay. that's the logic behind that. And, 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 and along those lines, I mean, each of us need money. I mean, we just need to figure out what's the fair way to distribute the money and then just let us, you know, we all have projects that are in the pipeline. I've had projects in the pipeline for over five years, you know, and I've had people that are in Section 8 that have been waiting over five years. So, I mean, we can spend the money. We just, we need, just need to get access to it and to have a committee start down the line, you know, about where and when should we spend it. I mean, each of us as cities, uh, <laughs> I think all of us have a, have a way to spend it. We just need to get it. We don't need to build another, I'll just say more government to, in order to try and do this. That's monies we could be using to spend on housing. Well, why don't we let Supervisor Lawson Reamer comment here since um, this was a suggestion from her. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Blakes for, I, I actually just wanna take a step back um, and put our housing crisis in regional perspective. Um, we have a regional housing crisis. Um, it, this is something that affects all of us. It affects all of our cities. It affects all of our communities. It certainly affects my entire district. Um, and we have all in our own silos been attempting to tackle this uh, challenge on our own. And frankly, um, we haven't gotten very far. I mean, I think we know that the arena numbers themselves as assignments um, are don't translate into affordable housing. I I live in Encinitas and I know that density often does not equal affordability um, and that we need significantly more innovative approaches, more resources, um, but not just more resources. We need a regionally coordinated strategy that looks at how do we build a table that has um, communities at the table, that has um, you know people who care about our environment at the table, uh, but also as a developers at the table, affordable housing advocates at the table, so we can come up with solutions that you know really think outside the box. Because if we just continue doing what we're doing, um, and frankly taking Mayor Hall's approach, which is to just be trying to beg for a little bit more money here and there, we're never going to get out of this crisis. We've been building you know, less than half the housing we need for our community for over two decades. And we are so far in the hole um, that we absolutely are, are not going to be able to solve this problem without a regional um, solution. And I, I think from my perspective, uh, some of the most important questions have to do with how do we ensure that we're building right, the right kind of housing in the right places, near job sites, near where people actually go to work, um, as opposed to us just thinking about, you know, the, the, the streets and the, and the people within our own cities and in our own jurisdictions, uh, because frankly, we are an integrated, um, an integrated regional economy. Um, and if we don't think about this solu the, the solution to the housing crisis from the perspective of a regional integrated economy, we're never going to be, be, begin to be able to tackle them. Um, and I think some of the, uh, the best things that SANDAG brings um, is our ability to coordinate jurisdictions, to coordinate regionally, to coordinate these uh, cross-cutting challenges that, um, that we cannot tackle alone. Um, you know, and obviously that's most clearly exemplified in the work that we're doing to try to build a transit system that works for everyone. Um, and part and parcel of transit is housing uh, because it matter. you cannot build transit if you don't build it for where people live. Um, these are two, um, two halves of the same coin. Um, so, you know, I think to me, this is absolutely vital that we move forward with a housing subcommittee so that we can begin to uh, tackle housing uh, from a regional perspective. Um, and that that is able to take into account um, the diverse regional needs that we all have. And so that the, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Um, and I, you know, uh, Mayor Blakes, or sorry, uh, Chair Blakes, I'm happy to uh, kind of go into more detail on some of the uh, initiatives and projects that I imagine us taking on. But, um, you know, I, I just want to stop there and see if there's any other questions. Yeah, I mean, I think that that from my perspective, that's fine. We don't, you know, we have other things that are on the agenda to talk about this. 
in many ways, you know, Sandag does do RENA and it was as the chair of that working group, that was very difficult and divisive. And it would be nice to have uh, more collaboration with the agencies talking about um, housing in advance of RENA, the RENA process. And also, you know, we are a convening, an organization that has all of the board members, all of the jurisdictions in this county. So if there's board energy to do things that are related to, to Sandag's mission, and especially using models that are seen in other counties in the state, to me, it seems like it's perfectly fine to have this kind of thing centered in Sandag. And also, I mean, as Hassan said, there's up to $100 million that, that is coming through this agency that is available for housing uh, projects. So that, you know, that's a substantial amount of money. Um, let me call on some of the other hands that are up. I know a number of you have, but let's try to get through this consent because we also have an agenda item. So Mayor Jones. Thank you. Um, I actually wanted to talk on item number seven, but since item number six was brought up, I personally, uh, we in San Marcos have about 7% of our uh, housing stock as deed restricted affordable. So we've done fairly well in all of that, better than many of the cities. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about having um, overreach. I, I'm always uh, fighting state overreach. I don't really want other cities to tell me how uh, I should be building in my city. Uh, so that would just be some of my concerns. Um, but uh, specifically about item number seven, uh, we haven't talked about this in a while that I can recall. And I've been on the board either as an advisory member or as a, uh, a primary member uh, way back when we started talking about the stopover. And we had talked about the stopover. I have a, I have a couple of questions. We talked about the stopover being a uh, headquarters for Sandeck and I'm not sure if we're still planning on that happening. Um, and if we are, um, that would be good to know. And I, I think it would be uh, timely to have an update for the whole board uh, because it is uh, something that we really need to talk about, putting a lot of money into that. Um, I know this is um, actually um, MTS putting money in and all of that, but um, if it is not uh, us taking the lead on this and us actually looking at this as a headquarters, I think it would be important that MTS take the lead on this instead of SANDAG, uh, because it is still staff time that we're uh, using on this. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping that um, I can get some answers as far as is this still going to be a headquarters? And then um, could we please get an update for the entire board? Because I can tell you, uh, my memory is a little fuzzy from several years ago. We'll be happy to put it on the agenda for the board to get uh, as much information as you need to, Mayor. And, and is this still uh, envisioned as being a headquarters for Sandag? I, right now it's envisioned to be a bus stopover because the buses right now are parking on the streets, both the rapid and the local. and. It's envisioned at stopover. What happened after that is yet to be decided by this board uh, okay. and others. Um, yeah. So in our update, could you make sure that you uh, let us know how many dollars that our Sandag uh, regional dollars have expended, uh, been expended on this project then? Absolutely, we would. Uh, right. totally. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Minto. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as far as uh, the consent calendar. Um, I would like to uh, not pull, but make sure that I have a registered no vote on item number eight. And then also, um, just as a uh, kind of a uh, respect item, I think, it, and this has to go to a comment that uh, that the supervisor made regarding uh, Mayor Hall's opinion. And um, if we disagree with one another, I think it's okay if we say we disagree, but when we make a, a, a comment that, for instance, was, um, you know, if we keep doing it Mayor Hall's way, we're never gonna get anywhere. Personally, I think that's disrespectful. And I would just ask the other board members, that we, if we disagree, let's just disagree, but not make, you know, kind of remarks that are, you know, kind of mean spirited. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, there are two more hands up, but I just want to ask the attorney, does it, do you think we should pull items like Mayor Mento said he'd like to register a no vote on one thing? Should we vote on them all, the ones where there are no votes separately so we go through it? If the votes are going to be different, I would advise that we pull those and take separate votes so the vote is as clear as it can be for the record. Okay, so, and and um, 
just so I understand uh, what you're saying, Mayor Minto, you would like to go back to in-person and not continue teleconference meetings. Is that is that your, your what you're saying there? That's correct. Okay. Okay. So let's pull for the consent, and I'll I will call the other two people, but let's pull item number eight and then item number um, uh, six so that people can vote def differently on that. But we're, I'm gonna continue taking the comments from two board members and then we'll vote on the whole consent and then we'll vote on those two items. So um, council member Shu. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanna make a quick comment with regards to item uh, six. There's an intersectionality between housing and transportation. Uh, so I think it is important that we address housing issues and a matrix that I wanted to that I've mentioned before, which I think uh, we need to start tracking is the combined cost of housing and transportation as a percentage of family income. Uh, many other planning agencies um, uh, have started to do that. And I think we should start looking at that within our region. Uh, I think that is a matrix, uh, a data point that we need to start looking at because we know when transportation and housing costs exceeds um, 50, 60, sometimes up to 70% of family income, that really hurts the nutrition budget as well as a number of other issues for these families. And those, those are the communities that we should uh, at least uh, know where they are in our uh, region so that we can uh, see what we can do to help uh, that, that particular uh, data point. Um, uh, with, with that, I'm, I'm really happy that we are looking at housing I also want to remind us uh, that within our regional transportation plan, there is a um, uh, series 14 uh, item in one of the appendices that really directs uh, all of us to uh, pay attention to where housing is in our region as it affects uh, transportation needs. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, council member. Um, all right, I see there are not any other hands up. So um, we will, I'll entertain a motion on the balance minus those two that have been pulled, which are six and eight. Chair, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could we, we do have a hand up from the public if we could take that before the votes? Of course, yes, let's go to that public speaker. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine Rhodes um, has her hand up and she'll be followed by Mike Bullock. Catherine, you can go ahead. Um, hello, this is for the item number seven, the bus, um, the bus stopover. So back in 2016, um, instead of, you guys actually doing a geotechnical investigation. You guys did a geotechnical or geologic conditions evaluations for that site. And in your, in your actual report, in one of your figures, you show an active fault going directly toward the site, but you didn't even do any trenching. You literally did nothing. And then what you said is you can assume that there's no active faulting on site when in the downtown special fault zone, you have to say that there is active faulting on site, and then you have to do your investigation to say, um, you know, to prove that there is no faulting. So anyway, you literally skip that step. I've been talking about this, you know, back since 2016, and I thought you guys would do some more work, but I don't see that you've done anything since then. And so before you put any more money into this, I believe that you need to do a geotechnical investigation flat out. And then also, if your staff could look again at what they did do, and then you could see that it was completely inadequate for, um, for this. And you're spending millions and millions on a project that might not be able to be developed because there's going to be an active fault going through that. And this is, um, you know, the, the San Diego fault. This is the one that that's actually in the Alpus Priolo map and in, in all this. And so um, I don't think that you should put any more money in this. Um, I think you should look at your geotechnical um, geologic constraints evaluation report. Look at figure 2.2, the potential fault rupture and fault rupture zone map that shows that the fault um, going directly toward that site. And you know, this is a fault that was um, that precluded the federal courthouse to be built um, where it used to be. And then we have we had to move it because they found the fault. They moved it um, you know, to the other side of Broadway. So I don't think that you should spend any more money on this project until you actually do a fault investigation. You know, it's gonna cost you like $15,000 and you couldn't even do that. And are lacking in your basic due diligence of this. And so if, if you're, you know, executive director 
thinks that it's good and there's no act of faulting, that would probably be good enough for me. But I haven't seen that anybody has done any type of third party review on this inadequate report. And I would say um, direct your staff to follow state law because you're not doing it right now. And hopefully you'll do something about it this time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Mike Bullock. Okay, thank you very much, uh, board. I, I hope that uh, there's a full discussion about general equitable housing, and there should be a study, uh, and I hope there's discussion today. Um, and there's two things I want to comment on about that. And one is that uh, we see surface parking um, at regional shopping centers, small sh shopping centers, office buildings, and there and it parks about 120 cars per acre. That's what you get out of service parking, about 120 cars. Um, you could also uh, provide uh, 10, 20, 30 housing un units there. And um, so I, I just wanna make that comment. I, I think that uh, around our transit stations and Oceanside and um, Carlsbad and so on and so forth is very misused. It's not being efficiently because of a good car parking system. Um, also want to point out some social equity issue. You know, when you build parking, you, you only have so much land, you only have so much money, and you have two things fundamentally that you want to build. You want to build housing and you want to build parking. Those two things. And they conflict. Less money for parking is more money for housing and more land for uh, for parking means less land for housing. And so you need a fair, equitable uh, system. And um, this is something which is urgent because there are single parents renting apartments that don't own a car and they're having trouble putting food on the table. And how is the rent collected? If there's one rent and it, covers both parking and housing. And this is a serious matter and it should be ended. And yes, when you unbundle the cost of parking, then you have to have a good parking system in the neighborhood around. You have to have a good car parking system um, for, the, for the unit and, and free parking is, isn't a good system. And unbundled is much, much better and it's much more equitable and it puts food on the table immediately so I don't know how you can stand in the way of that, but that's not really a good system either. And there will be houses parked in the neighborhood. And um, so, you know, there is a good car parking system. It was uh, proposed in detail by the plaintiffs in the lawsuit against the um, county and their uh, very deficient climate action plan. So, um, yeah, equitable housing, uh, you, you need to focus on that for sure. And one of the things you focus on is, is how you're handling parking because there's this, there's acres and acres of parking around stations and um, we could make better use of that land. We have a housing shortage and it's too expensive and, and bad car parking systems is part of the problem. Thank you. Thank okay, you. And thank our final, you. I'm sorry, we do have one other speaker with our hand up. Chair, if you'd like to take that. Okay, yes. Um, our final speaker will be Lori Saldana. Lori, you're self-muted at the moment. You can go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. And uh, this is actually a, a process um, inquiry. Are, are you, is, is this item two that people are speaking on, the approval of the meeting minutes? Uh, we are actually taking all of the consent items as a group right now. Um, so this, you are welcome to comment on anything that is on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. So one of our, our there are approval of meeting minutes uh, included on this, and I'm relatively new to to the Sandag format, so I was trying to find where on the website the minutes are provided. Um, so uh, it's as someone who's presided over meetings with a lot of details and information, I appreciate there's a lot going on today, um, but that is something in the packet. It, that uh, the supporting materials, it didn't include the me meeting minutes. So for, for people who might wanna go back and refer to that, um, 
I'm, I'm still searching on the website, trying to. Uh, Lori, the, the minutes are actually included as part of the agenda packet. So if you if you open up the PDF, um, you'll see items 2A through 2C uh, in the bookmarks, and uh, you can you can ref, you can take a look at the minutes that are in there. Okay. Um, I'm also happy to reach out to you after the meeting if there's any that you feel like you need. All right. Very good. And uh, thank you. I appreciate that. That's sure. that was it. Just a question. Thank you. Uh, Chair, that's all the commenters on the consent agenda. Okay, so we're speeding forward here through our consent. <laughs> so I'll take, I'll uh, entertain a motion on the balance. So that's minus so six move, and eight. So move, okay. Chair Sotelo Solis. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Let's go ahead and vote. Thank you very much. For the city of Carlsbad, Mayor Hall. Aye. For the city of Chula Vista, Mayor Salas. Yes. For the city of Coronado, Mayor Bailey. Yes. For the county of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Yes. For the city of Del Mar, Mayor Gasterland. Gasterland, yes. For the city of El Cajon, Mayor Wells. Yes. For the city of Encinitas, Chair Blakespear. Yes. For the city of Escondido, Mayor McNamara. Yes. For the city of Imperial Beach, Council Member Spriggs. Yes. For the city of La Mesa, Council Member Shu. La Mesa, yes. For the city of Lemon Grove, Mayor Vasquez. I apologize. Uh, for the city of Lemon Grove, Council Member Musgrove. Um, oh, I'm oh, um, hi, Mayor Raquel Vasquez. Yes. Thank you very much, Mayor. I'm sorry about that. Uh, for the city of National <laughs> City, second vice chair, Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, aye. Thank you for the city of Oceanside, Council Member Rodriguez. Rodriguez, yes. Thank you for the city of Poway, Hello. Mayor Voss. Aye. For the city of San Marcos. <laughs> what way we should oh, go? And go in. Go. I'm sorry, Mayor Vasquez. I think you're, thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for okay, I'm gonna, I, for the city of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria. Aye. Thank you for the city of San Marcos, Mayor Jones. Jones, yes. Thank you for the city of Santee, Mayor Minto. Minto, yes. Thank you for the city of Solana Beach, Mayor Hebner. Hebner, yes. And for the city of Vista, Mayor Ritter. Ritter, yes. Thank you very much. And that does pass unanimously. Okay, thank you. So now we're on to item number six, which is the Housing uh, Regional Equitable Housing Committee. So I would entertain a motion here. Move approval. So tell us only second. Great, let's go ahead and vote. Thank you. For the city of Carlsbad, Mayor Hall. No. Thank you for the city of Chula Vista, Mayor Salas. Yes. For the city of Coronado, Mayor Bailey. No. For the- Okay, thanks. For the County of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Yes. For the City of Del Mar, Mayor Gasterland? Yes. For the City of El Cajon, Mayor Wells? No. For the City of Encinitas, Chair Blakespear? Yes. For the City of Escondido, Mayor McNamara? Yes. For the City of Imperial Beach, Council Member Spriggs? I'll come back to Council Member Spriggs. For the City of La Mesa, Council Member Shu? May say yes. Thank you for the city of Lemon Grove, Mayor Vasquez. Mayor Vasquez, yes. For the city of National City, second vice chair Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, aye. Thank you for the city of Oceanside, Council Member Rodriguez. Rodriguez, no. Thank you for the city of Poway, Mayor Voss. No. Thank you for the city of San Diego, <laughs> Vice Chair Gloria. Aye. Thank you for the city of San Marcos, Mayor Jones. No. For the city of Santee, Mayor Minto. Yes. For the city of Solana Beach, Mayor Hebner. Hebner, yes. Thank you. And the city of Vista, Mayor Ritter. No. Thank you. Uh, Ed Spriggs uh, has returned. I stepped away. I vote aye. Thank you very much, Council Member Spriggs. And with that vote, that motion does pass. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, next we have item eight continuation of teleconference meetings. This is just for one month, by the way. Um, I'd entertain a motion here. 
Move to approve. Ellis. Second, Gasterland. Thank you very much. <clears throat> for the city of Carlsbad, Mayor Hall. No. Thank you. For the city of Chula Vista, Mayor Salas. Yes. Thank you. For the city of Coronado, Mayor Bailey. No. For the county of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Yes. For the city of Del Mar, Mayor Gasterland. Yes. For the city of El Cajon, Mayor Wells. No. For the city of Encinitas, Chair Blakespear. Yes. For the city of Escondido, Mayor McNamara. Yes. For the city of Imperial Beach, Council Member Sprays. Yes. For the city of La Mesa, Council Member Shu. Yes. For the city of Lemon Grove, Mayor Vasquez. Mayor Vasquez, yes. Thank you. For the city of National City, Second Vice Chair Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, aye. Thank you. For the city of Oceanside, Council Member Rodriguez. Rodriguez, no. For the city of Poway, Mayor Voss. Yes. Thank you. For the city of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria. Aye. Thank you for the city of San Marcos, Mayor Jones. No. For the city of Santee, Mayor Minto. Minto, no. For the city of Solana Beach, Mayor Hebner. Hebner, yes. For the city of Vista, Mayor Ritter. Yes. Thank you. And that item does pass. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, now we are on to our reports. So the first one is Antoinette and Crystal from Sanday with representatives from Caltrans and the San Diego Housing Commission are here to walk us through the digital regional equity strategy and action plan. So go ahead, Antoinette and Crystal. Thank you, Chair. Happy holidays to the full board. Antoinette Meyer, your Director of Mobility and Innovation here at Sandex. So in October, Crystal and I provided you with an update on the state of the digital divide in the region and our high-level strategy for addressing it. And since then, we have gone ahead and turned that strategy into a very comprehensive action plan that we're super excited to share with you today. We have key partners from the Digital Divide Task Force with us, uh, representatives from Caltrans and the San Diego Housing Commission. Um, you'll get to hear directly from them on work that they already have underway to help implement key components of the action plan through our partnerships. Next slide. This has been a very quickly evolving project. There has been a ton of work done in a very short amount of time to get us to this point today. Our involvement started in 2020, shortly after government, uh, Governor Newsom issued Executive Order 7320, and that really set the state in motion to bring high quality, high speed broadband service to every household and every business in the state. Shortly after, the state issued their broadband action plan, which was completed last December, and then in January, we stepped up to be regional leaders and you all approved a resolution committing us to developing a regional digital equity strategy and action plan. That same month, we formed the Digital Divide Task Force, we got to work developing vision and goals and guiding principles, and we kicked off a broadband gap analysis to really establish a baseline for the digital divide in the region. And while we were doing that gap analysis, we learned that the SR67 corridor was lacking that critical fiber communications infrastructure. So we quickly partnered with Caltrans and the county to add fiber communications infrastructure to a planned paving project that will fill 18 miles of that gap. And that project is expected to go to construction in the spring. And a big thank you to our board of supervisors members who are here today for supporting that project. In the summer, we were fortunate to have global tech company Cisco Systems um, learn of our work, um, get excited about it, and offer to partner with us and bring some more resources to the project. They brought on a team of ex experts that conducted um, many stakeholder interviews that really helped to shape our action plan, and you'll hear a little bit more about that process in a few minutes. In late summer, we completed the gap analysis. We published all of that data in an interactive story map, shared it with you, and we finalized the strategy with the task force. While all of this was happening, the state and federal government passed some monumental bills that will bring many billions of dollars to broadband. Much of that will be available through formula-based and competitive grant programs. And this is important because all of the work that we've completed to date has really set us up and prepared us to be very competitive um, for these funding opportunities. Our action plan demonstrates that we are ready to go. We, we can execute, we have the partnerships in place. 
And in fact, just a few weeks ago, we got some very exciting news from the California Department of Technology. They announced that they are advancing 18 middle mile priority projects. And due to our advocacy work with the California Public Utilities Commission, the San Diego region is actually set to receive the largest investment in the state. About 150 miles of middle mile network will be constructed here over the next two years. And we're really excited to partner with Caltrans to deliver those projects. We also um, just received a grant from the California Emerging Tech Fund um, to kickstart implementation of this action plan. And then that brings us to today. As we committed to you last January, we're here delivering a regional action plan for your consideration. Next slide. So just a quick reminder, the purpose of this action plan is to ensure that everyone has access to high quality broadband connectivity and can use technology to improve their lives. And we do this by providing better access through infrastructure and then expanding adoption of technology. Next slide. Our action plan is organized under seven overarching strategies that are really focused on building consensus that broadband is an essential public utility, a public service and public agencies need to plan for it building out that critical communications infrastructure in the areas of greatest need. And that communications infrastructure is also absolutely essential to the future of transportation. Establishing partnerships to ensure that all of the investments we're meet, uh, re making are reaching every single household, and then advocating for more resources for digital equity programming and services. I'd like to give a Shout out to um, a handful of cities who are already working on planning for digital equity. Chula Vista uh, was the pioneer really in our region. Oceanside recently kicked off their digital equity plan. The city of San Diego has had really incredible programming during the pandemic, getting people connected. And the county of San Diego is doing a ton of work um, to plan for uh, broadband infrastructure. So big thank you to all of you for being our partners. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Crystal. She's gonna talk you through quickly how we went from this high level strategy to a comprehensive of action plan. Crystal? Thank you, Antoinette. Good morning, board members. So as Antoinette mentioned, you know, we did a lot of work to turn that strategy into an actionable plan that we can begin implementing right away. And to help prepare the region for success, we were really fortunate to be able to partner with Cisco, um, who brought a team of amazing experts and their proven roadmap development process to help us better understand stakeholder viewpoints, pain points, um, turn those into regional priorities, and in turn, actionable recommendations that we can integrate into the action plan. And so to help advise Cisco and our team along the way, we also convened a small leadership team of really amazing influential leaders, many of whom are representatives from your organizations to advise us and ensure that the process and the work product was ultimately inclusive and reflective of regional needs. So shout out to all of the uh, leaders that participated through the effort. We appreciate your participation and support throughout the process. And in developing this roadmap, Cisco led an incredibly extensive outreach process. We, they conducted over 60 stakeholder interviews that represented over 40 different organizations at many levels of government, regional, state, federal, uh, nonprofit organizations, educational institutions. And those interviews culminated in over 4,000 different data points on the various opportunities for digital equity and also the, the various barriers, policy and institutional barriers for advancing digital equity in the region. And with the help of our leadership team in Cisco, we were able to transform all of those thousands of key points into five key priority areas for the region, which you can see on the slide here. Um, all of these really intersect with the strategies that Antoinette just talked about, and we're really critical in developing the strategy and action plan that we have brought forward to you today. Now this action plan is incredibly comprehensive and lays out various near-term and continuing actions that SANDAG, the task force, and many other partners will need to work together to advance. There's a lot of work to be done, and though we've only just released the action plan, there are many initiatives that are already underway. First and foremost, as Antoinette mentioned, it's important that we continue to establish consensus in the region that closing the digital divide is a regional priority. Many of your jurisdictions are in the process of adopting a resolution similar to the resolution that this board adopted earlier this year. We wanna work with you to continue expanding that in the region and also take the steps to proactively plan for broadband infrastructure. And to help your jurisdictions do this, we plan to convene a broadband permitting work group in the new year to help us develop standard practices, model policies and templates for things like fiber sharing, um, how we might implement a dig ones policy in the region or develop a master encroachment permit to expedite broadband in areas of need. 
We'd also like to inventory all of the public infrastructure that many of your jurisdictions have already laid out um, and develop a, a regional master plan, a regional strategy for building out a resilient public fiber ring that can connect all of our jurisdictions to support the transportation network and ultimately provide more affordable internet in public locations like your city halls, community centers, and libraries. Caltrans is here today. They're gonna to share an overview of how the state is making an enormous investment in broadband and how we're partnering to help deliver on some of those initial projects that Antoinette just mentioned. And when this is complete, this is gonna provide a lot of our rural and tribal lands with greater connectivity. And finally, to get us ready for much of that forthcoming state and federal funding that Antoinette alluded to, we've recently partnered with um, the Southern California Association of Governments, SCAG, and released a joint request for qualifications just a few days ago, actually, to help us identify those potential organizations, broadband providers who may want to partner with us and co-author on uh, some competitive grants to expand broadband infrastructure and bring more services to the region. We're also advancing many near-term actions on the adoption side. Uh, our digital divide task force over the course of a few months has been a really amazing forum for dialogue and exchange. Um, and we plan to continue convening the task force as well as many other stakeholder groups who continue sharing information, best practices and cross-promoting all of the amazing work that our partners are leading. We hosted a workshop with public housing leaders a few months ago, planning to host a workshop in the next few months as well with public health organizations on ways to improve connectivity for telehealth. And then as we've navigated the, the past two years throughout the pandemic and our new normal, um, we've seen a lot of great programs and resources uh, launched. Uh, many of your jurisdictions have um, implemented hotspots and libraries. There's subsidies to provide affordable internet to households. There's just not a lot of awareness of all of the various resources that are out there. So to tackle this head on, we've started work to develop uh, an education campaign to help build awareness of all of these great resources and information that can improve uh, internet for our households. And with the help of the social equity working group, community-based organizations, all of your jurisdictions, uh, networks like 211, we wanna ensure we're reaching as many people as we can. And the goal of all of this is to create a central repository of information, a portal that people can access uh, readily and provide greater visibility to all of the amazing organizations that are providing digital literacy training, um, that are donating computers or providing you know, direct assistance to communities. Organizations like San Diego Futures Foundation, for example, um, have wonderful programs that are improving uh, internet access for many. In fact, they have a computer donation program where they refurbish uh, technology devices and donate them to nonprofits or communities in need. A few months ago, Sandag donated over 100 computers to San Diego Futures. We know the city of San Diego has also participated in the program. We'd love to see your agencies do the same as you phase out uh, various technology devices. And so to round out this uh, presentation, we've invited two task force members here today to share some of the exciting initiatives they have underway to implement many of the early actions in the action plan. So first, we're gonna kick it off with Caltrans. Chris Schmidt, who's a deputy right-of-way director, is gonna talk about how Caltrans is playing a key role in building out broadband infrastructure as part of its transportation portfolio. So Chris, take it away. Thank you, Crystal. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and board members. Glad to be here. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Caltrans to partner with Sandag on these uh, enormous efforts that Crystal and Antoinette described. Uh, so next slide, please. So we've been under various directives for some time since in 2020, uh, we've been under an executive order to work on Dig Smart, which is really the concept that when the department is working on transportation projects, to also include fiber in those jobs, to really work with the industry to identify locations throughout the state where broadband is needed and previously has not been uh, accomplished for various reasons. And so we've been doing a lot with the industry to work with them to identify that. Uh, once upon a time, I was the broadband coordinator for the state as a whole when I was in Sacramento, and I brought a lot of that experience down here with me to San Diego. And we continue to do that work throughout the state. As part of that, when SB 156 was passed, as was mentioned, $6 billion were made available for broadband infrastructure. That covers a number of different investment areas. Um, a big one that we're looking at in, within the region is the middle mile. And the middle mile is really the portion that is kind of the transmission lines, kind of like what we have in electric power. You know, somehow you have to get the power from where it's generated 
all the way to the end user. And the middle mile is very important. And in our conversations with industry and various stakeholders, the state highway system has really been identified as the key backbone for that middle mile component of the system overall. So of the $6 million, there's quite a bit of money available. And that, that money, which is about $3 billion, is overseen by something called the Middle Mile Advisory Committee, which is made up of, of various state entities that are overseeing that funding program that was initiated through SB 156. And what you can see and what Crystal was mentioning earlier is the map of the various corridors that have been identified throughout the state. And you'll see there's a large concentration here in San Diego County uh, largely credited to the fact that we were very engaged with the process, were heard um, at the CPUC and with the California Department of Technology, where we'd done a lot of analysis on where the gaps are in our network and where investments could be very helpful. So next slide. So as part of that, as I mentioned, there's about $3 billion available for that middle mile network. It's uh, administered at the state level by the California Department of Technology, in partnership with the California Public Utilities Commission and what's called a third party administrator, which is an entity that really specializes in broadband connectivity and is working directly with Caltrans to administer that program overall throughout the state. As mentioned, there's 18 corridors. We have four here in the region on 67, 76, 78, and 79. And as you can see on the map, we're really serving some of the most rural components of our region. And, and what's exciting about this too is this is going to provide better access, especially to our tribal nations uh, in those rural communities, as well as rural communities that have been underserved with lower speed connectivity or for that matter, no connectivity at all. So very excited about that. Uh, next slide. So as part of that deployment, we've been working, as you heard, well in advance of SB 156 on the SR67 project where we have an 18 mile paving project between Santee and Ramona. And as part of that, we really wanted to implement the Dig Smart policy that I mentioned earlier that, that we're charged to implement. And we partnered uh, with Sandeg and the county to figure out how to add that component to our paving uh, project, which we did. And we were very successful in, in figuring out how to do that in the last minute. And, and hats off really uh, to everyone that's participated in that. It's not easy sometimes to make those changes to a project. And we're looking now to, um, to really add that component when we go out to bid here at the end of this month. Uh, with construction of the project actually planned uh, in the spring of next year uh, when we're able to pave in the, in the warmer conditions. The exciting thing will be that this is likely to be the first middle mile corridor delivered in the state. So we're very excited to lead the way for the rest of the state and how we can partner effectively and also deliver a product in a very, very expeditious manner. Uh, next slide. Uh, so thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to my friends at the Housing Commission to talk about their programs. Good morning, board members. I am George Williams, Director of Compliance and Equity Assurance for the San Diego Housing Commission. And with me is John Reels, Director of Integrated Strategies. And thank you for the opportunity to share with you today information about the Housing Commission's initiative to address the digital divide among households with low income that reside in affordable rental housing the Housing Commission owns or manages. Next slide, please. The Housing Commission's diverse real estate portfolio consists of 2,401 affordable rental housing units at 150 properties. Of these units, 189 are federal public housing units. The remainder are deed restricted, so rents remain affordable to households with income up to 80% of San Diego's area median income. These affordable rental housing units include single family homes, duplexes, single room occupancy units, and medium to large size multifamily housing properties, as well as garden style communities. The properties in the Housing Commission's real estate portfolio are in locations throughout the city from the international border to the south to Del Mar Heights to the north. A majority of the properties are smaller with 10 to 12 units. These smaller properties do not have community or recreational rooms on site. At some of the larger properties with more units, uh, computer labs on site are available for residents. However, the need for more technical support exists for that type of amenity. Next slide, please. 
Good morning, board. My name is John Real, Director of Integrated Strategies for the San Diego Housing Commission. The Housing Commission's objective is to provide broadband services for all units. However, the largest challenge to achieving this objective is ongoing service costs. Funding appears to be available for initial infrastructure, but the long-term sustainability of services is uncertain without sufficient additional funding. This year, the Housing Commission conducted a survey of residents at our properties to enhance our understanding of residents' internet needs, identify the types of resources needed, and determine the anticipated ongoing service costs. Next slide, please. The Housing Commission conducted the paper-based survey, uh, mailed-in survey with more than 2,000 residents this past summer. Approximately 20% of residents participated in the survey. These are some of the results and common themes we found as a result of, of this effort. Most of our residents do subscribe uh, with a service provider for broadband access. Residents reported their costs at uh, are more than $50 a month, with many paying more than $200 a month for bundled services to include TV, phone, and internet. Most Housing Commission residents use their cell phones for broadband access to conduct business and personal use uh, to keep access and equipment costs more manageable. The majority of these residents use um, their broadband access to conduct online banking, access government services, and to connect with family and friends. They also use broadband to stream entertainment, order food, and access emails. With majority of our residents who responded to the survey indicated that broadband costs are a hardship to keep up with or an item they do not subscribe to to save money. The majority of the survey respondents are considered senior, senior citizens, and during the pandemic have had to rely more on broadband access um, for needed services. They have concerns with overall accessibility related to language options and disabilities, online security, and needing training uh, for better use and understanding of both equipment and internet use. Next slide, please. In October 2020, the Housing Commission's executive leadership established the Compliance and Equity Assurance Department to support equity and inclusion in existing and future programs, policies, activities, and practices. The Housing Commission evaluates initiatives for equity and inclusion before finalizing decisions. The Housing Commission has joined the Government Alliance on Race and Equity this is a national network that offers a professional peer-to-peer -peer network that enables government equity directors or leads and subject area experts to exchange information, collaborate to advance their practices and develop solutions to equity challenges. Through this membership, we were able to connect with other entities and establish a relationship with the city of Long Beach, which has already implemented a digital inclusion program. Through this relationship, the Housing Commission was able to share best practice information, which in turn led to the development of the residential survey discussed in this presentation. The equity team reviewed the survey and provided recommendations prior to the release. And finally, the Housing Commission is in the process of launching a web page that will include information about the Digital Divide Initiative, as well as digital inclusion community resources such as uh, multilingual resource guides, low-cost internet service providers, affordable computer resources, possibly free computer literacy training services, and locations such as libraries or parks that offer free public Wi-Fi and computer access. Collaboration will be essential to bridging the, uh, the digital divide. The first step is shifting the mindset from thinking of internet access as a commodity to what it truly has become a necessity. Uh, the San Diego Housing Commission is exploring opportunities to work with community-based organizations to support and provide education and training programs for our residents, as well as expand our ex existing infrastructure to increase and improve accessibility. Ensuring equitable access and resources, regardless of housing type, is a key focus for us. Therefore, the Housing Commission is really working closely across divisions to ensure different property types are able to support updated broadband access. Additional collaborations include work with service providers like Cox and other organizations that represent sponsored low-cost broadband access, as well as some of our partnerships with community-based organizations and nonprofits um, with different programs to provide things like hotspots, computer labs, device access uh, and training, as well as community space uh, to hold some of these trainings. 
Continuing to bring awareness to the digital divide has proven extremely helpful in our effort to implement resources for the communities and people that we serve. Uh, our continued collaboration with SANDAGS, Digital Divide Task Force, um, and the San Diego Promise Zones work groups and the SoCal Transformation work group are a few ways uh, that the San Diego Housing Commission is actively engaged in the conversation and effort to expand digital equity, inclusion, and access. In conclusion, the Housing Commission is also currently working on drafting a request for proposals uh, to support ongoing efforts and identifying uh, funding sources to provide more options for residents affected by the digital divide. Next slide, please. That concludes our presentation. We are available to answer uh, any questions. Thank you, George. John and, and Chris. Um, so with that, the recommendation today is that we ask the SANDAG Board of Directors to adopt the Digital Equity Strategy and Action Plan as a regional model to bridge the digital divide. And we're happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any public comments on this item? Thank you for the presentation. We do have two public comments on this item. Okay, let's go ahead and take them. Or wait, excuse me, our executive director has his hand up. Hassan. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you, Antoinette, and uh, George, and John. Thank you to our partners from Caltrans. Let me just remind uh, the, the board of directors a couple of things. One is, uh, and Chris uh, from Caltrans will relate to this. We were the first in the state to take the executive order of Digit uh, One's policy, and we got with our partners from Caltrans real money to put 18 miles of broadband to our uh, rural communities on, on, the, on the 67. We, we did that because we, we felt very strongly that uh, connectivity uh, and bridging the divide is important. That is why when, uh, from, uh, we're a transportation agency, well, why would you think we wanna be in digital divide, right? Connectivity is important. Um, we were actually, in terms of the governor budget, the largest place in the state, San Diego, in, in having available funding. So uh, we, we do have the reach with our partners uh, from Caltrans, from the San Diego Housing Commission, that I think you should be proud of uh, that reach. And, and we do have Antoinette and Crystal that uh, they're leading the statewide group. They're absolutely a source for uh, statewide uh, things. And, and Chris is, is a local uh, person who worked in, in Sacramento. So I just want you to know, this is no small part. This took a lot of work, but it, it showed result. 18, 18 miles of broadband. Uh, I'm grateful for District 11 and Gustavo and Chris and, and the headquarters for making San Diego an example of how we actually move forward in bridging the divide. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the public comment. Thank you, Chair. First will be Lori Saldana, who will be followed by Nicole Burgess. Lori, you can go ahead. There we go. Thank you. I, I want to make a suggestion that the uh, programs establish partnerships with the regional community college districts, uh, especially San Diego District's College of Continuing Education. Uh, for nearly 30 years, the district has provided access to free technology training programs. And having access to the broadband per se is not enough to encourage people and support them in using it most effectively. And uh, 20 years ago, I was teaching information technology at the educational cultural complex and managing a department um, of labor federal grant to renovate computer labs on campus. And we extended our classrooms and offered free technology classes to residents at Bayview Terrace Apartments, Jackie Robinson Y, and other offsite classrooms in traditionally underserved um, parts of the San Diego community. So I think um, affordability is certainly a, a, an issue. And I wanna refer to a San Diego City Council Economic Development Committee report that showed that in our innovation uh, sector here in San Diego, the lowest employment are people of color in the information, professional science, technical and educational services. And uh, women and uh, black indigenous people of color are less likely to, to have access to these quality jobs. So while we speak about the, the hardware being installed, um, don't lose sight of the human uh, software uh, part of this as well, because 
uh, we're leaving out too many people in our community from access to these jobs, being able to work remotely, being able to have higher incomes to support their families and uh, invest in their family's future. And it also results in much higher death rates for people who don't have access to these jobs. Um, COVID is killing many more people of color in San Diego because they are doing uh, essential work uh, that sometimes because that's what the, the training that they have available to them. So people who work in construction and, and can't do remote type of work have been the most likely to die of COVID in San Diego County over the last uh, coming up on the two years now. So the innovation economy that is so essential and the reason we need this broadband uh, connectivity, um, it won't meet the ultimate goal unless there is also education and training provided to people who are struggling to pay for these services. So I encourage SANDAG and the Housing Commission to look at not only the, the costs uh, for communities, but realize that the reason that uh, it is disproportionately harmful to low-income people is that they don't have the skills to use this technology, have jobs in the innovation economy, and perhaps by partnering with our uh, especially the community colleges, which are providing increasingly free classes and programs to these low income communities, you can really have this be an overall success. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Nicole Burgess. Nicole, you can go ahead. Good morning, Chair Blake Spear and Sandag, and happy Friday to all of you. I just want to give a big shout out and thanks to all the leaders that have been involved and all the collaboration from Sandag. Caltrans and the San Diego Housing Commission for the collaboration and the partnerships and to really create an action plan that is ready for funding. So I definitely support this effort to bridge the digital divide and thank all of you for participating and really working together to make this uh, happen quickly. Thank you. Thank you, and Chair, that does conclude the public comments. Um, there were a couple of folks who put their hands up after the original call. Uh, so if you do want to make a statement on this item, please feel free to reach out to me at clerk of the board at sandag.org, and I'll make sure those comments are on the record. Okay, thank you. Um, and if we have um, board member comments or questions, and then I would entertain a motion. So Council Member Spriggs. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I was very impressed with uh, Lori Saldana's comments uh, about the, the real meaning of digital divide and, and uh, creating equity in this area. And um, for me, and you know, I haven't uh, I haven't followed this as closely as uh, as other board members, perhaps, but it seems to me that the the infrastructure plans, uh, including the um, the uh, the broadband. Uh, fiber optic plans are properly geared to the rural areas and especially the tribal areas, which are have had neglect for many years. And I would, I support that hundred percent, but I'm not sure that the South uh, Bay and the uh, Southeast San Diego community, which uh, Lori Sadania uh, alluded to as having been victims of the digital divide for many years are really part of the plan for the new infrastructure, the fiber optic infrastructure. I may be wrong, this is a factual question and perhaps they could clarify whether those areas are already well served or are planned to be well served with high speed fiber optic, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think that's very important considering the maps that we saw uh, where the new, um, uh, the new fiber optic is going to be uh, installed. So to me, that's a real important issue. We know the South County, uh, South Bay, and we know that the Southeast uh, area of San Diego is a heavily minority occupied um, uh, residential uh, part of the community and has been long neglected in many ways. And we really have to be extra certain that those areas are going to be uh, supported by this initiative uh, geographically uh, and demographically supported uh, by this initiative uh, and, um, and that we see some concrete uh, hardware and software developments that make sure that that happens. Thank you. 
Just, uh, just uh, Amana Antoinette would like her to comment on the, you're absolutely right, uh, council member, and and it's, it's, it is intended to close the digital divide everywhere in the county of San Diego, and we have the data to see that divide, but Antoinette, go ahead and, and come to the council member. Yeah, thank you for that comment, Council Member Spriggs. So you did see a lot on infrastructure today and the maps that Caltrans showed um, on the middle mile network were focused on the rural areas, but our action plan is comprehensive and it has um, is divided in two sections, the infrastructure and then adoption. And adoption includes service affordability, getting technology in the hands of people who need it, training them on how to use it, um, and other supportive services that are needed. So it's very comprehensive. When we came in October, we shared um, a lot of data and maps on the digital divide um, in the San Diego region. And you're, you're absolutely right. Southeast San Diego um, and some of the communities in South Bay are affected, but they're affected differently than the rural communities. Adoption's low there because the cost of internet service is, is very high. So the programming that we're, we're proposing um, for urban areas like Southeast San Diego is a bit different. It's less about the infrastructure and it's more about bringing down the cost of the internet service and getting the um, supportive services to the community residents that need it. Okay, thank you. Um, Gustavo from Caltrans has his hand up. So go ahead, Gustavo. Delarda. Thank, thank you, Chair Blake Spear. I, I just want to address uh, the question by Council Member Spriggs. The 18 projects that were shown on that map on a statewide basis are just the initial projects that California Department of Technology identified as large gaps in the middle mile. They're not the end of the projects that uh, we will undertake um, on our system. So, so there are other areas, uh, there are some gaps in the urban side of the house as well that will be addressed later. This is just the first round. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mayor Salas. Thank you very much for this really important um, information. I just wanted to let everyone know that the city of Chula Vista and Sandag have been working in partnership along with the other regional partners on our digital equity plan uh, for a number of years now. And we've made a tremendous amount of, uh, of progress. And just uh, last week, we approved a contract with uh, a company that will be laying fiber throughout the city of Chula Vista um, for many, many you know, miles, and including underserved areas. I mean, that's really a focus of ours. So I don't know what other individual uh, jurisdictions are doing, but if anyone wants access to our digital equity plan, we worked for years on it and I think it's a really good document. Was that a motion, Mayor Salas? Oh, sure. <laughs> if you wanna take it as a motion, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. We have a motion. Second. Mento, second. Okay, Mayor Mento got it. So let's go ahead and vote. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the city of Carlsbad, Mayor Hall. Yes. For the city of Chula Vista, Mayor Salas. Yes. For the city of Coronado, Mayor Bailey. Yes. For the city, I'm sorry, the county of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Yes. For the city of Del Mar, Mayor Gasterland. Yes. For the city of El Cajon, Mayor Wells? Yes. For the city of Encinitas, Chair Blakespear? Yes. For the city of Escondido, Mayor McNamara? Yes. For the city of Imperial Beach, Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs? Yes. For the city of La Mesa, Council Member Shu? Yes. For the city of Lemon Grove, Mayor Vasquez? Mayor Vasquez, yes. Thank you. For the city of National City, Second Vice Chair Sotelo Solis? Sotelo Solis, aye. Thank you. For the city of Oceanside, Council Member Rodriguez? Rodriguez, yes. For the city of Poway, Mayor Voss? Yes. For the city of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria? Aye. For the city of San Marcos, Mayor Jones? Jones, yes. For the city of Santee, Mayor Minto? Minto, yes. For the city of Solana Beach, Mayor Hebner? Hebner, yes. And for the city of Vista, Mayor Ritter? Ritter, yes. Thank you. And that does pass unanimously. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's great. So now we're on to our next item. And this is the Sandag Community Benefits Agreement, which is a collective bargaining agreement between Sandag, the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades Council, and the signatory unions. 
We have Victoria Stackwick and Elaine Richardson, who are here with Dan Sloan to walk us through the CBA. So Victoria, Elaine, and Dan, we'll take it from here. But just as a reminder, if you'd like to speak on this item, please put your hand up if you're a member of the public. Um, uh, get in the queue during the staff presentation, and then um, we'll figure out how many people we have, and then we'll decide on the length of time. So um, just make sure and get your hand up right away. So with that, I'll hand it over to staff. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Victoria Stackwick, and I serve as the Director of Government Relations for SANDAG. I'm joined by Ms. Elaine Richardson, Director of Diversity and Equity for SANDAG as well. We also have three technical experts with us, Mr. Dan Sloan, Vice President of Labor Relations, Parsons Corporation, Mr. Marty Glasky, Senior Vice President, Client Development with GAFCON, and Mr. Julian Gross, Partner at Rennie Public Law Group. Dan, Marty, and Julian worked closely with Sandag staff to represent the agency through the labor negotiations. Next slide, please. As you know, earlier this year at your February meeting, the board adopted an, an equity statement. The statement is a commitment made by the board to address systemic racism and provide a plan to guide Sandag policies and programs and address equity and inclusion. Subsequently, at your April board meeting, a resolution was adopted that directed staff to consider local workforce and careers in construction, specifically through a project labor degree agreement. This action was followed up by the board at its July meeting, where they provided the authorization to begin negotiations with the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades Council for a PLA, which is also called the Community Benefits Agreement or a CBA. Next slide, please. Immediately following the July 23rd meeting, staff began negotiations based on the extensive feedback provided by the Sandag Board of Directors, promoting local hiring practices, creating economic stability, and providing employment and training programs for systemically marginalized were all policy objectives aimed to be addressed by the Sandag CBA. Implementation further of the recently passed 2021 regional plan would be the catalyst for meeting these specific equity goals in our region. Next slide. So let's get to the key components of the CBA. The agreement is inclusive of both union and non-union contractors. The board also provided direction to staff to include all state and federally approved apprenticeship programs. This was echoed by the Black Contractors Association, the Associated Builders and Contractors, and the Association of General Contractors of America. As a result, these provisions are included in the proposed CBA. Additionally, the proposal allows for flexibility for disadvantaged businesses regarding hiring and benefit contributions and increases the goals for disadvantaged and targeted worker employment programs. Under the CBA, the SANDAG workforce programs would substantially expand the agency's ability to train and employ underserved populations. I'll now turn it over to Ms. Elaine Richardson, who will go into the details of how SANDAG's work program and its components would increase its current reach and help the agency meet its overarching adopted social equity goals. With that, Elaine. Thank you, Victoria. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna start off with the work program and how it will enhance the Community Benefits Agreement. The Workforce Opportunities for Rising Careers Program is our approach to targeting workforce equity through a community benefits agreement. Work is really a testament of the Sandag equity statement. We wanna create inclusive programs for targeted and disadvantaged workers and also disadvantaged businesses. It includes a pre-apprenticeship program. This began March 1st of this year, and we partnered with the San Diego Workforce Partnership, the Building Trades, in the San Diego Community Colleges. The program provides training and other supportive services to underserved individuals in our community so that we can help them enter into quality jobs in the construction industry. The next programs are a disadvantaged and targeted workers program, which we're actually gonna have goals associated with them on covered CBA projects. And these are gonna include individuals from low income areas, and specific targeted worker goals, such that we can utilize formerly incarcerated homeless and also students from our pre-apprenticeship programs. 
And finally, we're going to incorporate the Helmets to Hard Hats program. This program, and what a better place to have this program, it connects transitioning veterans with career opportunities in our construction industry. So if you take all these components of the work program, they're gonna be included within the proposed CBA. It's gonna to strive towards upholding the agency's commitment to equity. Next slide, please. The CBA includes a disadvantaged workers program and we're gonna be establishing a 30% goal of the total hours worked on each construction project. These hours are going to be performed by disadvantaged workers. And these workers reside in low income zip code areas within the San Diego County and also across the nation. And we're also gonna include veterans. They can reside anywhere. They don't have to just be in low income areas. They can reside anywhere. And finally, a disadvantaged in area indicates a zip code area with median household income for a family of four that is below 80% of our average income in the San Diego region. Now, I know that's a lot to take in. So what does that really equate to? It equates to 69,000 for a family of four on an annual basis. In San Diego alone, there are approximately 1.2 million people who reside in these low income disadvantaged areas. The CBA is gonna focus on local low income zip codes, including communities that are closely surrounded and impacted by each project site. And what that, what that means is we're gonna look at a project and we're gonna look at a three to five mile radius of that project. And we are going to outreach to local workers in those areas. So our vision is that this program is gonna put hundreds if not thousands of disadvantaged individuals to work on Sandeg projects. Next slide, please. The targeted workers program focuses on recruiting workers from vulnerable and underrepresented populations to work and participate on Sandeg construction projects. The CBA requires that really our contractors and unions must work together to achieve a goal of at least 10% of the total hours worked on each construction project, these must be performed by targeted workers. And really by implementing this targeted workers program, we're gonna be advancing inclusion in the workforce by increasing access to jobs for workers who face barriers to employment. We're gonna improve the economy by increasing employment and household incomes. And we're gonna benefit businesses by identifying a reliable source of local workers. Next slide, please. These are the vulnerable and underrepresented populations within the Targeted Workers Program. The Apprenticeship Readiness Collaborative ARC Program, which is our pre-apprenticeship program for the region, it focuses on these categories. And recently we've had additional student successes from our third cohort, which just ended on November 30th. I just wanted to share a few of these student successes with you today. One of the students was formerly incarcerated for 25 years and he just graduated from the ARC program. And this individual, he passed the sheet metal apprentice exam while he was in the ARC program. And now he's gonna start his formal apprenticeship training in January. And then our next student, she's a single mother. She was on public assistance over the past year and a half. And during her participation in our ARC program, she had passed the electrician apprenticeship exam, which is such a difficult test to take. And is now working with Baker Electric. She's a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Union. The ARC program will graduate almost 200 students over two year period. And our CBA should provide jobs to thousands of targeted workers on Sandeg projects. We've included an additional category so that we can hire some of these ARC students on the targeted workers program. The CBA is helping remove barriers to employment for disadvantaged individuals and we are targeting workforce equity. Next slide, please. So here's some of the CBA provisions. It's gonna prohibit discrimination. And this is really based on race, national origin, religion, sex, sexual orientation, political affiliation, 
or a membership in a labor organization in hiring and dispatching workers for the project. It's gonna promote labor harmony. Our projects are gonna have guarantees against work stoppages, strikes, lockouts, and any other types of disruptions for the project. We're also gonna provide neutral dispute resolution procedures. And what's that, what that means is that if a dispute arises, we're gonna have a neutral arbitrator take care of this. And finally, it's gonna provide a supply of skilled and trained workers. The CBA permits all qualified contractors and subcontractors, and I really wanna emphasize this, all qualified contractors and subcontractors to bid for and be awarded work on the project, regardless if they are union or non-union. Next slide, please. So these are the significant CBA takeaways that we've discussed today. First, it will be inclusive of all union and non-union firms. And second, it allows for all state and federal approved apprenticeship programs to participate. We have a disadvantaged workers goal of 30% for individuals that are in our low income areas of the region. There's a targeted workers goal of 10% for veterans, apprentices, homeless, and the formerly incarcerated. And finally, the CBA allows for disadvantaged business exceptions that will pro promote the participation and growth of our small and disadvantaged businesses that means so very much to us. The CBA takes effect when executed by Sandag, the Building Trades Council, and the various individual unions. Next slide, please. The negotiated community benefits agreement will ultimately advance racial equity, assist vulnerable individuals, and support underserved local communities. It really achieves workforce equity that is a key component of a thriving and inclusive economy that benefits all workers, residents, and communities. The Board of Directors is asked to authorize the Chief Executive Officer to execute the negotiated community benefits agreement between Sandag and the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades Council in substantially the same form as attached. And now we would be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Um, there are two of my board members with hands up and I'm wondering if they have questions or statements. Vice Chair Gloria? No questions, I'm interested to hear the public comment. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mayor Jones, do you have a question or, com or is it a comment? We'll, we'll take comments after the public. Oh, wait, we can't hear you. Sorry, I just turned it off and then turned it back on. Yeah, I do have a couple of questions. Um, so what are our local hire statistics currently? Do we have that number? We'll let staff jump in and answer her questions here. Yeah. Um, Well, and, and my follow-up will be, um, if we do um, uh, know what those statistics are, what are they um, projected to be with this uh, action? So currently it really is dependent on the project. Um, I can say, you know, on big projects like Midcoast, we were about 50 to 55% local hire. We, it's really difficult at this point to project what the percentage will be once we implement these programs. But of course, we will definitely be higher, hopefully, than the 50 to 55%. Well, there was a statement that was made pretty early on in the conversation uh, or the presentation. And it said, um, it, it was that uh, we're focusing on disadvantaged workers in San Diego County, but then also throughout the country. Yeah. So. I know, let me explain that to you. Because we we receive federal funding for our construction projects, we cannot limit it to local workers, but we have a great uh, new um, bill that's been passed that will allow us, like San Diego, like this agency, to actually apply for, to this pilot program so that we can use local workers on our federally funded projects. But we had to put that in there because it is a requirement of receiving federal funding. So it's a requirement if there's a PLA or if, it, if there is no, a 
it's a Thank requirement you. anywhere whether we have a pla or not we cannot just say we were we we're going to reach out to local workers we have to include all workers but as you know there's not going to be a lot of workers out of state from across the country that are going to be participating on our projects well i don't i don't know i don't know that i yeah I, this isn't my daily wick <laughs> okay okay so we're at about 50 to 55 percent right now today average ish and we don't have any idea what the what this action would do to um, project what what those numbers would be with the project labor agreement not at this point okay all right okay i i just want to hear some more um uh information uh from the public but those are my questions i think for now thank you okay thank you um so we do have about uh at least 50 speakers so we're, we'll do one minute each but i want to make sure that questions from board members so if you could ask your questions um quickly so we can get to the speakers that would be great so mayor gasterlin i have a comment my hands up for comment okay um council member Ela rivera thank you chair uh, it's a it's a follow-up to the last question that was asked actually if um if, if staff could perhaps speak to while it's not necessarily possible to predict the percentage of of local hire that would occur with a disagreement in place is it correct in my understanding that um by putting an agreement like this in place it becomes easier for the training programs to then begin the pipeline necessary to ensure that there's a there's a bigger pool of local uh folks to be hired to end up filling those positions and without the certainty of an agreement like this it's more difficult to be to, to get that pipeline set up. Yes, Council President, that's fair to assume. Okay. Simple thank enough. You. Thanks, Hassan. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, so we'll go to the public comment now. Um, Francesca, how many do we have? Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have 50, was it 51? 54. Okay. Okay, let's uh, go ahead. Mayor with Bikespear, if yes. I could, 30 seconds. Yes. Uh, I mean, this is a very important issue. Could you find it possible maybe to go two minutes versus one minute? I mean, I, there's a lot of energy in this in the community, and I think they should be given at least two minutes. You know, I'm sorry, but given the fact that it's 1045 and this is going to be at least an hour, we, we, we really start to lose a quorum. So we need to be able to get through this. And I think, um, I think I'm going to stick with one minute, but I, I do appreciate your suggestion. So go ahead, Francesca. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the first speaker will be Alexis Hamid. And uh, the name I see after Alexis is San Diego and Imperial Counties. And I'm sorry, it cuts off there, so I'm not sure what the rest is. Uh, but Alexis, you can go ahead now. Hi, um, policies are put in place to stop injustices. However, on December 17th, SANDAC is voting to approve a new policy that overrides existing policy. Working backwards, PLAs are banned in San Diego. Is this the new Jim Crow? There could be no justification for you all to vote to move through with the CBA and hope that it does right. You guys done that and it didn't work. When a system does not work, you start over. Mayor Gloria, you spoke with the fourth district on a Zoom and you talked about your parks master plan and how the current system for park funding was was wrong and that you wanted to prioritize the areas with the greatest needs. Look at this through the lens of the parks master plan. Is this a priority? Is this the prioritization of the greatest needs of the people being met with the CBA? To the members that vote for the CBA, this vote will follow you forever, just as it will affect the young emerging BIPOC, no GED, no high school diploma, former foster youth, former incarcerated, single parent, starting apprentice community. Remember, you use us in your marketing materials. They will know who voted them out and had a lottery picking for people to come and put in hard work in their community. Action speak louder than words while your work. Thank you. Our next speaker is San Diego and Imperial Counties, followed by Sean Rogers. Uh, good morning, board members. My name is Bridget Browning. I am the secretary treasurer of the San Diego Imperial Counties Labor Council. I am urging you to vote yes on item number 14 and approve the negotiated community benefits agreement between SANDAG and the San Diego Building and Construction Trades Council. Our community benefits agreement includes local hire, which will put local workers who pay taxes towards SANDAG construction projects to work on these very projects. It keeps these valuable dollars in our communities and allows these dollars to change hands up to six times in our local economy. 
This community, community benefits agreement includes local hire to provide opportunity for targeted recruitment for apprenticeship programs. Apprenticeships start with a job and lead to middle-class careers in the construction industry. Our community benefits agreements include local hire provisions to provide quality family health, dental, and retirement benefits for all construction workers. For many construction workers, these agreements will provide these life-changing benefits for themselves and their families for the first time and create family legacies for generations. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Sean Rogers, followed by Nephi Hancock. I'm gonna move on to Nephi while Sean is muted. Uh, Nephi, you can go ahead with your comments when you're ready and Sean will come back to you. Good morning, board members. My name is Nephi Hancock and I am a union electrician with local IBEW 569 and I live in Spring Valley. I urge you to support item 14 and vote to approve the negotiated community benefits agreement between Sandag and the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades Council. Our community benefits agreement includes local hire will put local workers who pay their taxes towards Sandeg construction projects to work on these very projects. It keeps those valuable dollars in our communities and allows these dollars to change hands up to six times in our local economy. This community benefits agreement includes local hire to provide opportunities for targeted recruitment for apprenticeship programs. Apprenticeship starts with a job and lead to middle-class careers in the construction industry. And we've already started pre-apprenticeship programs. Thank you. I'm gonna come back to Sean Rogers. You are self-muted at the moment, so you can begin when you're ready. And Sean will be followed by Lori Saldana. Okay, I apologize for the meeting. Um, good morning, my name is uh, Sean Rogers. I'm a proud local 619 union carpenter uh, member. Um, I pride myself in the skills and the training I received as an apprentice. I'm a six period apprentice. Um, PLAs matter to um, myself as well as thousands of tradesmen like myself. Um, be able to, be able, being able to provide for my family with health care, uh, a home, my wife and my newborn, you know, to be able to participate and grow my community, to have the ability to work, you know, close to my home, to watch my newborn grow. And it's all important to me and many of my brothers um, as an African-American, as a former foster youth and as a former um, convict, um, I support this PLA and uh, and I'm proud to say it um, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lori Saldana, who will be followed by Lynn Miner. Uh, good morning again. I am a uh, retired teacher represented by a union. I was able to retire because of being in that union, but before I uh, did teaching, I was a union carpenter. I was often the only woman on the job site and the only Latina on the job site. And I don't see enough targeting here of workers who are women and women from communities of color. It's not enough to set goals if you're not committed to addressing those goals and have, uh, I see the, the, the carrots and the incentives, but not the stick. What are the uh, uh, binding arbitration is not a good way to resolve disputes. It favors those with the resources to have people argue on their behalfs. So, I really encourage you to reconsider how you're phrasing this, who you're identifying, and what hard specific goals you intend to achieve. And if those are not achieved, how you will remedy that, not with binding arbitration, but with hiring people who are historically disenfranchised from these jobs. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Lynn Miner, who will be followed by Noah Harris. Lynn, you can go ahead. Good morning. My name is Lynn Miner. I'm a state certified journeyman electrician. I'm a proud member of IBW 569. I'm co-founder of our women's committee. I'm a disabled veteran and a Chinese American. Today, I want to speak to my mayor, Mayor Minto, in support of the community benefits agreement. I'm a first generation electrician and in my 17 year career, I have worked locally building hospitals, power plants and the San Diego skyline. My family and I support this CBA because it will provide training opportunities for local men and women who are pursuing careers in construction. This is critical for local workers and their families. This CBA will ensure that veterans, females, minorities like myself have representation on this project so that workers aren't left to the whims of the biased contractors regardless of the union status. This representation has been crucial for me in my career and it will help my neighbors and theirs. 
By implementing this project with CBA, we will make our communities stronger by creating jobs with good wages, healthcare, retirement benefits, and apprenticeship training. All things that lay the pathway to the stable middle class for everyone. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Noah Harris, who will be followed by Christina Marquez. Good morning, uh, Chair and Board. This is Noah Harris with Climate Action Campaign speaking in support of the Sandag Community Benefits Agreement with the San Diego County Building and Construction and Trades Council. As we move forward with the five big moves and building out a robust transportation network to slash our transportation emissions, we must also deliver on equity and good jobs for our local workforce. Sandag has created a CBA with local hire that creates quality construction careers with prevailing wage apprenticeships, and quality health care. Finally, we urge Sandag and the Building Trades Council to ensure career pipelines for communities of concern to increase equitable access to these job opportunities for low-income communities and communities of color. Thank you, and we urge your support today. Our next speaker will be Christina Marquez, who will be followed by Nev Preston. I'm going to move ahead to Nev Preston and come back to you, Christina. Uh, Nev, you can go ahead when you're ready. Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Nev Preston. I'm speaking on item number 14 today. I'm a union carpenter for the local 619. I support PLAs, and my union supports them as well. Project labor agreements protects union workers through providing broader employment opportunities, specifically with expanded apprenticeship opportunities for minorities and women as well. I've resided in San Diego for 15 years now, and we need PLAs in action, and we want to keep our work local. Thank you, essentially. Thank you, Christina Marquez. You can go ahead with your comments. Christina will be followed by Sean Keone Ellis. Christina, unfortunately, we still can't hear you. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on and I'll reach out to you separately to get your comments for the record. Uh, Sean, you can go ahead with your comments. Sean will be followed by Javier Alvarado. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Ellis. I'm the political organizer for United Association Local 230, the plumbers and pipe fitters here in San Diego. You know what, since I got one minute, I, that means I only got a limited amount of time to say what I have to say. So this is gonna go out to item 14. We are in support of community benefit agreements. You know, I stand here and I listen to some of these people in opposition to community benefit agreements. I am a Pacific Islander, Asian American individual. I'm a veteran. I am an individual who used that helmets to hard hats program and a testament that community benefit agreements and transition programs work and can help our city. So I think it's absolutely disgusting that someone who lives in a community will go against that. So this goes out to Mayor Gloria. Thank you for your leadership. We stand behind you. We wanna make this city better. Community benefits agreements do that. And any elected official who goes against the community benefits agreement should be questioned on whether they truly care about what our community is. It provides uh, labor uh, provisions to get good jobs, good apprenticeships for our community. Thank you for your time and have a beautiful day. Our next speaker will be Javier Alvarado followed by Francine Maxwell. Good morning, board members. My name is Javier Alvarado. I am a proud San Diego Labor's Local 89 member, and I live in National City. I first joined the Labor Union through the apprenticeship program. Years later, graduated to become a full-fledged, skilled and trained journeyman. Honestly, this is one of the best decisions I've made in life. My family and I have personally benefited from the opportunities provided to us by the union, and I strongly believe my community will be stronger if my neighbors have that same opportunity. I ask you to support item 14 and vote in support of the community benefits agreement. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Francine Maxwell, followed by Jennifer Wilson. Francine, you're self muted at the moment. You can go ahead when you're ready. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Francine Maxwell, Southeastern San Diego community activist, 
uh, area of concern, speaking on behalf of some of my sisters, Black journey women who don't want to pay union dues. They heard the presentation, all qualified non-union and union firms, but some of them feel like they're professional sweepers because they have not been trained in some apprenticeship programs. And so I want to make sure that the elected officials understand Malcolm X Library, located in southeastern San Diego, had a solar parking structure built with men and women from Vegas. So I need you to question real intensely when they talk about local hire. We've had things happen here in San Diego and it's not right. And our area of concern of Southeastern San Diego, $6.1 million leaves. So I wanna make sure that people know we make money, but our money leaves our community. So vote no on 14. I think our next speaker will be um, Jennifer Wilson, who will be followed by Kiara O'Laughlin. Good morning, board members. My name is Jennifer Wilson. I'm a Navy veteran. I was a Hallmark to Hard Hats participant, and now I'm a journeyman wireman electrician. I urge you to support item 14 and vote to approve the negotiated community benefits agreement. Our community benefits agreement includes local hire, which will put local workers who pay taxes towards sand day construction projects. I have personally benefited from these opportunities by being afforded the opportunity to work as an apprentice on these jobs finish an apprenticeship program and be the first time home buyer for my family to reside in the community we work in. And I believe my community will be stronger if my neighbors have the same opportunities as I do. Um, unlike the former female politician who spoke in opposition of this policy, times are changing. I'm a female who finished an trades apprenticeship program. I work in the field side by side along with my other sister union members. I conduct outreach and welcome more women into the trades and mentor the next generation of female electricians. And all trades members. And in closing, I ask you to support the community benefits agreement for the better of everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kira O'Laughlin, who will be followed by Dustin Steiner. Good morning, board mem members. My name is Tara O'Laughlin. I'm a researcher and policy advocate with the Center on Policy Initiatives, a local nonprofit economic justice research and advocacy organization. We urge you to vote to approve the negotiated community benefits agreement between Sandag and the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades Council. The CBA will improve opportunities for local workers. It includes local hire, which provides targeted recruitment for apprenticeship programs that lead to middle-class careers in the construction industry with quality wages and benefits. Not only will this agreement make a positive impact on individual workers and their families, it will also benefit our region as a whole. Local hiring can improve employment outcomes in communities with high unemployment, and reduce employment disparities between communities. Finally, local hire will put local workers who pay taxes towards sand and construction projects to work on those very projects, keeping those valuable dollars in our communities to improve economic growth for our city and region overall. Please vote yes on this community benefits agreement. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dustin Steiner, who will be followed by Gretchen Newsom. Good morning, Sandag Board of Directors. Dustin Steiner speaking on behalf of 900 union and non-union member companies of the Associated General Contractors San Diego chapter. Our members have been building San Diego for the past century. We have traditionally had a good relationship with Sandag. Unfortunately, this so-called community benefits agreement is nothing more than the standard National Building Trades Project Labor Agreement. Despite past board promises and words to the contrary, these PLA provisions actually prevent non-union apprentices from working on the projects due to the small number of poor workers, three, and not being able to meet the journey person apprentice apprenticeship ratios required by state law. Also, retirement benefits do not go to any worker who does not vest with the union, which is generally five years. The $5 million threshold is an improvement, but the vast majority, if not all, of the work currently covered by local contractors will still be covered by this PLA and will therefore exclude many local and non-union subcontractors. We're disappointed that Sandag decision makers did not engage with the AGC, and we hope you will go back to the drawing board to meet with all stakeholders and ensure all of San Diego's diverse workforce. Our next speaker will be Gretchen Newsom, who will be followed by Derek Phillips. Good morning, this is Gretchen Newsom on behalf of IBEW Local 569 or 3700 Union Electricians and Power Professionals. Honorable board members, what you have before you today is the gold standard of a community benefits agreement. This is inclusive on equity and inclusive of all state approved apprenticeship programs. And today you have the ability to transform careers and change lives, making a real difference in the lives of thousands of local working families. 
Make no mistake, projects under this agreement will be awarded through a fair, open, and competitive process for union and non-union contractors alike, allowing companies and DBEs to grow and thrive. But the true gem and benefit of this community benefits agreement or labor agreement is the impact it has on the workforce with local hire, apprenticeship opportunities, and the creation of construction careers for local families, including those that have had barriers to career entry like the formerly incarcerated. This agreement creates more pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship opportunities. I will also share with you that IBW 569 has strong leaders from the BIPOC community in leading our apprenticeship efforts, including our lead instructor and full-time community outreach coordinator. But we'll do better. Please vote yes. Our next speaker will be Derek Phillips, who will be followed by Chad Barkley. Good, more, good morning, board members. My name is Derek Phillips. I live in the city of Lemon Grove, and I'm an Af active Afro-American union member with the Labor's Local 89, with well over 40 years in the trade. I can honestly say that my union has supported me and my family with great benefits and job security, along with a good pension. I respectfully ask that you support item 14, the community benefits agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Chad Barclay, followed by Tommy Howe. Good morning, board members. My name is Chad Barclay, and I'm an electrician of 19 years and a proud graduate of the Electrical Training Institute Apprenticeship Program. I join you today in full support of the Community Benefits Agreement and in support of the hundreds of good paying jobs it will create for local construction workers like myself. During my career, I had the opportunity to work on the nearby trolley extension and building schools and modernizing classrooms for San Diego Unified. And it's really special I got to build the very schools that both my children attend. They have a strong sense of pride and community connection that their dad built the school. In a similar vein, our IBW 569 electricians and power professionals are really excited to build Sandax infrastructure and ride the rail with our kids. Thank you for your support of creating jobs for local construction workers and local families today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tommy Howe or possibly Huff. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Uh, followed by David Grubb. Hi, good morning, board members. My name is Tommy Howe. I'm a San Diego County Planning Commissioner and a resident of Mira Mesa. And I'm excited to hear about the details today. And I just wanted to make, um, uh, make a moment and uh, voice my support for the Community Benefits Agreement between SANDAG and the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades Council. My father taught collective bargaining at the University of Pittsburgh Law School. And I believe we're on the right track and on a strong trajectory to ensure we're getting the best, most verifiable and most complete work on this agency's related projects when utilizing a PLA or a project labor agreement. Um, as an environmentalist, I know there's a strong institutional understanding within the trades of the variety of environmental dynamics when it comes to these projects. I think we're also uh, aware of the greater seamlessness of work, the ability to complete jobs on time and within budget, um, and community stability and opportunity offered when utilizing PLAs in these spheres, not to mention the use of skilled and trained workers detailed in the presentation. I'm supportive of this. I believe you are as well. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration today. I'm in support of 14. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Grubb, who will be followed by Eric Stevens. Uh, good morning, Chair Blake Spear and board members. David Grubb uh, speaking today for the Quality of Life Coalition, a group of environmental, labor, and social justice organizations representing many thousands of uh, citizens of the San Diego region. This community benefits agreement is consistent with our core mission and goals and is supported by all of our member organizations. Please vote yes on item 14. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dr. Eric Stevens, who will be followed by Adur, Abdur Rahim Hamid. Good morning, this is Eric Stevens. I am the son of the former councilman and deputy mayor, George Stevens, speaking regarding the CBA. <clears throat> I've enjoyed listening and I was taking notes about the CBA key components that were mentioned, the disadvantaged workers program, the targeted workers program, and the CBA provisions. I thought they were all very well thought out, very positive in terms of providing jobs for individuals in the San Diego community. What I had a concern with though, is that there was no mention of the $160 billion and how that will be allocated equitably among both union and non-union workers. 
non-union workers do not receive the lion's share or even half of the resources as the unions do, both for apprenticeship programs or for contracting. Do not vote on this initiative. Our next speaker will be Abdur Rahim Hamid, followed by William Studham. Good morning, uh, Mayor. Uh, Mayors and council members of the Senate Board of Sandag. My name is Abdul Rahim Amid. I'm the president of the National Black Contractors Association. Again, I want to thank uh, Mayor Todd Gloria and Mayor uh, Scatello Solise for extending an invitation for us to sit at the table with Sandag to talk about some of the issues. I think what we have is near is almost a near perfect concept, with one caveat. When, you when we talked about asking who, where did the training contributions go for the allowed all apprenticeships, the money goes to the unions. And for us, that's like building bricks, with, uh, uh, bricks without straw. It reminds me of what happened in Allensworth when the blacks, first black uh, town settled here in California and they diverted the water away from that town, drying up the town and killing its community you are basically going to dry up the resources for the apprenticeship community. Right now, we're in dire straits to find skilled and trained workers, positive qual qualified contractors, and we need to use every resource. If we can pull... Our next speaker will be William Studham, followed by Christina Marquez. Good morning, board members. I'm William Studham, a Navy veteran and electrician with over 20 years of experience. I'm in favor of having this community benefits agreement on all future major construction projects. This will create opportunities for veterans like myself by connecting highly skilled men and women from the armed forces to promising careers in construction. Since 2003, throughout our nation, Helmets to Hard Hats outreach program, there have been confirmed placement of over 36,000 veterans into the construction careers and union apprenticeships many of whom, like me, have a disabled status. Multi-year agreements like this one offer critical opportunities for op apprentices in the construction trades to develop their skills and gain valuable experience. Investing in local apprenticeships creates a pipeline of reliable, experienced workers with the skills that will help ensure this and future public projects are delivered on time, on budget, and to the best public benefit. Please vote yes on item 14. Our next speaker will be Christina Marquez followed by Matthew Leba Gonzalez. Good morning, board mem members. My name is Christina Marquez and I'm the current environmental organizer at IBEW Local 569, apprentice graduate, journeyman and former community outreach coordinator at the apprenticeship. And I live in Escondido. Good morning, Mayor Mack. I urge you to support for the negotiated community, community benefits agreement. I have personally benefited from these opportunities of being in a state approved apprenticeship by being able to work on big projects like Southwestern Community College Football Stadium, Kaiser Hospitals, San Diego Unified Schools, Sweetwater Unified Schools, and many more. As a female electrician, I find it notable that our female electricians receive the same, same pay rate as family benefits as my male counterparts, regardless of working on public works or private. This agreement will shatter the glass ceiling and provide equity and opportunity for generations of women and families to come. Let's be bold and take the high road toward quality. Our next speaker will be Matthew Leba Gonzalez, who will be followed by Chris Allen. Good morning, board members. My name is Matthew Leba Gonzalez. I'm a proud third generation union laborer of Labor's Local 89. I am in strong support of a community benefits agreement. Along with exceptional pay, benefits, and a phenomenal pension, it provides hardworking men and women of all the trades mobility to the middle class. One aspect of these agreements I feel are important is the local hire element. By requiring workers from the community these projects are located in, it limits commute times, adding to a better quality of life by contributing to these workers being able to spend quality time with family. In addition, workers are able to be a part of projects that cosmetically transform their communities and empower these workers. 
These workers also contribute to local economies to help local businesses strive. I ask you to support item 14 and vote in support of a community benefits agreement with the San Diego Building and Construction Trades Council. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Chris Allen, who will be followed by April. Good morning, my name is Christopher Allen. I'm a proud union carpenter in San Diego and a community benefits agreement means in, in my personal life that when my wife was pregnant with my firstborn daughter, Brooklyn, I was able to work six minutes away from the project. I was able to make a good wage, have the benefits and make all the prenatal visits during the, uh, during the term of my, of my wife carrying my daughter. What this community benefits agreement is gonna mean, it's gonna mean that the city of San Diego will be building people who will be building America's finest city. I encourage you to support this community benefits agreement, get this thing passed, because there's families out here that need their dads and moms home every day rather than traveling long distances to build. Thank you. Our next speaker will be April, who will be followed by Dwayne Henry. Good morning, uh, board members. My name is April Hatton, and I am a proud union electrician with Local 569. I live in San Diego. I'm the president of the United Sparkies and a disabled veteran. Our I, IBEW, uh, United Sparkies are IBW 569 Women's Committee for Female Electricians and Power Professionals. And I too, and I too am passionate about having more women in the trades. Rather than making complaints, that not enough women are in the trades. The United Sparkies are conducting community outreach to women and girls, encouraging them to become trades women. Earlier this year, we sponsored and mentored 50 girls in a week long camp, introducing them to all the trades and construction careers. We helped the community, including local families in need, I'm, I'm sorry, in need on Indian reservations that needed electrical upgrades and connections into apprenticeships. The unions are doing hard work and meaningful work to change our lives and build stronger communities. And I ask. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dwayne Henry, who will be followed by Victor Morris. Dwayne, Good yourself. Morning, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Good morning, board members. My name is Dwayne Henry. I'm the president of More Electric Inc. Uh, we are a union affiliated of 569 right here in National City, California. I urge you to support item 14 and vote to approve the negotiated community benefit agreement between San Diego and, and San Diego County Building and Construction Trade Council. My family, community, and I have personally benefited from these opportunities. Uh, we were involved with the Mid Coast Trolley Project extension for over five years. Um, we had a payroll of over a half million dollars during this time, uh, one of the largest projects we've been a part of. Uh, so we could personally speak on being um, a union contractor and the benefits of being a part of the PLAs. So I urge you support uh, item 14. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Victor Morris, who will be followed by Javier Santizo. Hey, good morning, members of the board. Uh, my name is Victor Morris, and I'm a Black IBW 569 member and I support the community benefits agreement with the Trade Council. I am a San Diego native, born and raised in the Southeast area of San Diego. I worked nine union construction for 10 years and since joining the union, honestly, it's been a breath of fresh air. I not only have a voice, but a bright future and an equal opportunity to achieve success as well. I've heard people say unions are racist and I haven't come across that at all. The IBEW welcomed me in after being incarcerated and having a difficult time searching for a legitimate career. I've been treated well on the job site, and I'm excited to share that during the month of October, I was admitted into the union apprenticeship program. The IBEW program is providing full family health care to myself and my children as well. My union construction career is not only going to create a legacy for myself, but for my family also. Please vote yes. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Javier Santizo, followed by Ken Collier. Sí, buenos días, mesa directiva. Mi nombre es Javier Santizo. 
yo soy carpintero, nacido y criado aquí en la ciudad de San Diego y este, les quiero a pedir que por favor pasen y aprueben este acuerdo de proyecto laboral, siendo que habemos muchos carpinteros que queremos seguir trabajando cerca, cerca de nuestros hogares. Muchos de nosotros entramos a esta industria por medio, por seguirle los pasos a nuestros padres y este, tuvimos que trabajar en lugares fuera de, de nuestra ciudad y ahora que tenemos hijos para nosotros es una buena comunidad, es sano para nuestra comunidad, crear hogares donde los papás estén en casa. Este, a mí me enorgullece tener buenos sueldos y tener a beneficios médicos para mis cuates y para mi hija que tiene autismo. Y este, yo solo quiero que ustedes respalden este acuerdo de proyecto laboral. Gracias. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Ken Collier, who will be followed by Alex P. Good morning, can you hear me? We can. Oh, okay. Uh, good morning, board members. My name is Ken Collier. Uh, I'm a proud member of a Local 569 Union Electrician. I'm also a retired veteran, United States Marine Corps. And I currently work at the Electrical Training Institute, uh, San Diego. I urge you to support item number 14 and vote to approve the negotiated community benefits agreement between SANDAG and San Diego County Building Construction Trades. Our community benefits agreement includes local hire, put local workers who pay taxes towards SANDAG construction uh, projects to work on these projects. It keeps those valuable dollars in our communities and allows uh, these dollars to change hands up to six times in our local community and uh, economy. This community benefits agreement includes local hire, to provide opportunities for targeted recruitment for apprenticeship programs. Apprenticeship starts with a job. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alex P, who will be followed by Mel Landrum. Good morning. My name is Alex, and I urge you to vote yes on 14. I want to start by saying that I have been a resident of the County of San Diego for 36 years. I am a recovering addict and a convicted felon. Once upon a time I remember trying to get my life back on track and struggling to get around, taking the 945 bus to the 20 bus to the green line, uh, a two hour trip each way, only to be denied employment. The union, the IBEW 569, offered me a chance to learn and grow through their apprenticeship program, which I had graduated from last year. IBEW and all the The local unions are local workers for local projects. This is huge for our community. We have programs like EWMC, which is the Electric Workers Minority Caucus, which promote uh, equity, equal opportunity, and employment for minorities and under underrepresented workers at all levels of the IBW structure. The Community Benefits Agreement is what's best for the future of San Diego workers. Next speaker will be Mel Landrum, followed by Eric Christian. Good morning, board. My name is Mel Melanie Landrum. I'm a proud 619 Union Carpenter member. There are definitely high demands out there working in this field. Being a minority and a Black woman has been challenging because there aren't anyone like me on any of the job sites I've worked. I feel the PLA will ensure compliance with laws and regulations governing workplace safety and health Equal employment opportunity for us, for us skilled workers and labor and employment standards are not and will not be biased because I'm not a man. My concerns are knowing that I am treated fairly with equal pay, making sure that I'm able to provide for my family, knowing that there are jobs in my neighborhood and that I'm highly qualified for by, um, because of the training and skills that I've required through the apprenticeship program and set the foundation for the, for the knowledge that I have to take out to the field, implement in order to succeed. I strongly support item 14. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Eric Christian followed by Val Macedo Jr. Eric Christian Coalition for Fair Employment and Construction. As we listen to SANDAG staff and progressive board members drone on about equity, I'll remind the public that word stops having meaning when it interferes with the demands of the big labor special interest who fund their campaigns. 
your PLA implicitly excludes the 90% of the construction workforce in San Diego that's union free. It does this by limiting non-union companies to three of their own workers. Those three must pay their benefit monies $20 per hour into union trusts they'll never vest in. That's wage theft. They're also forced to pay union dues. Before union boss Tom Lemon was forced to resign in disgrace for stealing money from the workers he pretends to care about, he led this board's leadership and staff into believing it's okay to give unions a monopoly on all work in exchange for unions collecting the signature necessary to put a tax increase on the ballot. It's not. If the discriminatory three provisions I have highlighted are included in any PLA that's approved, we will actively work to defeat any future tax increase. You have it with your, in your ability to strike these three provisions, which have nothing to do with hiring anybody, but have everything to do with excluding people. Voters of San Diego have spoken when they voted 76 to 24% to ban PLAs. You need to do the same. Our next speaker will be Val Macedo Jr., who will be followed by Alistair Running Bear Mahal. Good morning, Madam Chair and board members. My name is Valentin Macedo Jr., and I'm a member and representative of the Labor's International Union of North America, Local 89. I'm calling to urge your support of item 14 to approve the, the negotiated community benefits agreement between SANDAG and the San Diego County Building Trades Construction Council. We are already seeing how these types of CBAs encourage out of town contractors to utilize local workforce. A great example is the Pure Water Project, where local hire would be much lower if it weren't for the CBA that is in place on that project. As a fourth generation union laborer from San Diego, I, pers I have personally seen the benefits of these types of projects, and I'm hopeful that we can continue to give these opportunities to the members of our communities. I ask your support for your support on item 14. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Alistair Running Bear Maholland, who will be followed by Dan Weisma. Good morning, board members. Um, my name is Alistair Running Bear Mahon, and I'm a union electrician with local IBAW 569, and I live in Oceanside. Oh. Good morning, board members. My name is Alistair Running Bear Mahon, and I'm a union electrician with local 569 of the IBAW, and I live in Oceanside. I urge you to support item 14 and vote to approve the negotiated community benefits agreement between SADAG and the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades Council. Uh, myself, I'm uh, the son of an immigrant from Ireland and, and also the son of a, a Native American and Mexican Indian. And, um, you know, before beginning uh, this apprenticeship program, I never had health insurance in my life. Uh, or dental insurance with any of my former non-union uh, employers. And, you know, now I, I've been able to see, see the doctor with some chronic issues I've been having. And I am closing to ask for this part in 14 and, and thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Dan Weisma, followed by Richard Cuevas. Good morning, board members. My name is Daniel Wisma, representing the San Diego Ironworkers Local 229. I, or, I urge you to vote for the approval of the negotiated community benefits agreement between the SANDAG, between SANDAG and the San Diego County Building Trades Council. This agreement would include local hire opportunities that will benefit our community. I have personally seen a lot of out-of-town and out-of-state workers thriving from our local construction work. Let's keep those hard-earned dollars within our community. I encourage you to help support our people. This will give my neighbors and your neighbors the chance at not only a job, but a career in which we'll provide quality health care, dental, and a retirement to look forward to. Let's keep San Diego strong. With that being said, I ask you to support item 14. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, Dan Weisma, followed by, oh, I'm sorry. Our next speaker is uh, Richard Cuevas, who will be followed by Hector Mesa. Hey, I thought you bypassed me. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Cuevas. I'm one of the founding members of Alianza 569 in uh, San Diego, California. We are part of the IBEW and a in partnership and part of the Electrical Workers Minority Caucus. One of our main objectives is to reach out into the community, primarily Latino Americans, Mexican Americans, first and foremost. And just to let you know, I'm a homeowner right there in the, the community of Nestor, which is an impacted neighborhood as well. Uh, this particular apprenticeship program 
is what led to my success. I'm a formerly incarcerated individual who spent about over a decade in the system, and I know how hard it is to get a job. Um, the IBEW let me in, now I'm in management. And speaking from a man managerial perspective, being able to communicate with people from different realms has severely increased our profits. Meaning I come from the union, we work well with the union, we make money. And I think everybody appreciates that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hector Mesa, who will be followed by Jeremy Abrams. Hi, my name is Hector Mesa, probably graduated from my local electrical apprenticeship program. And I am now a journeyman wireman in IBW 569 and a state, California state certif uh, certified electrician. I want to thank you for considering this project labor agreement and hopefully make it a done deal. Because PLAs are good for our community, they put local highly trained, skilled workers like me to work right here in our town. PLAs also help create more opportunities to, for others in our community to join the middle class by creating jobs and career training through state certified apprenticeship programs. More than 90% of all construction apprenticeship apprentices are union workers. We take pride in our work and we make sure that whatever project we build is done right the first time through good, good workmanship, experience, and most importantly, safety. As a journeyman electrician, it is my duty to mentor the next generation of apprentices to be the best our industry has to offer. Uh, we're ready to put our heart and soul into every project. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Jeremy Abrams, who will be followed by Richard Markison. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremy Abrams, and I'm the president of the San Diego Building Trades Council and the business manager of IBW 569. And I was on the negotiating committee that took careful steps to present you with this gold standard community benefits agreement today. I want to share with you that this agreement is inclusive and takes the high road in making sure quality construction careers are prioritized for local workers and from disadvantaged communities. Let me be clear, you do not have to be a union member to work on these SANDAG projects. And despite some of the opposition comments, I'll share that there have been plenty of non-union electricians working on the PLA under San Diego Unified that have qualified and received our union health care and even vested in our union pensions, all without paying union dues. So because of the PLA that was created on pathways to quality construction jobs, we urge you today to approve the CBA and item 14. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Richard Markison, who will be followed by Jess Hawes. Good morning, board members. I'm Richard Markison, uh, and I represent the more than 900 uh, apprentices in Western Electrical Contractors Association Apprenticeship Program, and I also represent the Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors of California, the local chapter of the American Fire Sprinkler Association, and the Independent Roofing Contractors of California. Um, you're, you're kidding yourselves if you think that adopting this PLA includes provisions that will uh, permit and encourage uh, non-signatory contractors to uh, work on Sandeg uh, projects. It is designed uh, from the outset to keep those contractors and those non-union workers and apprentices from working on your projects. That's the reason that PLAs exist. Uh, despite the best efforts uh, of the contracting community and folks that represent uh, non-signatory apprentices, uh, you've been fooled uh, by your leadership. Uh, this is an exclusionary PLA, and we urge uh, the members of the board to reject it in its entirety. Thank you very much. I think your next speaker will be Jess Hawes. Oh, I'm yes, and Jess Hawes, who will be followed by Doug Hicks. you hear me? Okay. Yes, good morning. Yeah, good morning. My name is Jess Hawes. Uh, I'm a retired veteran for over 28 years, been a general contractor since 1987 in the state of California. I'm also a proud and committed member of the National Black Contractors Association, as well as a, an apprentice instructor. And to say that uh, we really need our apprenticeship contributions JJ here Hawks. at the uh, 
the, the National Black Contract Association and not going to the unions. Under the President Obama administrative executive order, he stated that $50 million and below does not have to require a PLA to the work projects. My question is to send that limit, do not limit non-union only to 5 million, which is a discriminatory exclusion to small businesses and people of color. My request is to do the right thing for non-exclusion in federal state funds. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. I think our next speaker will be Doug Hicks, who will be followed by Nicole Burgess. Good morning, board. My name is Doug Hicks, Carpenters Local 619, here on behalf of our 6,000 members. Um, I'd like to talk about the numbers. PLAs, I've had the opportunity to work under community benefits agreements and PLAs as both labor and management. Um, at San Diego Unified School District, we see over half of the contracts awarded to non-union contractors. For an alleged discriminatory contracting policy, it doesn't seem to be to uh, be prohibiting anyone, regardless of their signatory status, from winning work. If these, if these community benefits agreements were so detrimental to the non-union workforce, I don't believe these contractors would continue to bid and win work underneath the cover of them. The fact that contractors, both signatory and non, continue to participate in these tell me one thing. It's good for all workers and all contractors throughout San Diego County. I urge you to vote yes on item 14, move it forward, create a true opportunity and pipeline, economic stability for our local workforce, and send a message. Those workers who have been historically excluded from the workforce, there is an opportunity for you to come forward, create true community wealth, and join the middle class. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Nicole Burgess, who will be followed by the phone number ending in 702. Uh, great. Thank you. Good morning, Sunday. And uh, just want to voice support for Agenda 14, CBAs, and all the supporters and their voices. We've heard some great stories of why this is so important. And as a past teacher, I understand the value of skilled, trained workers and uh, an advocate for our youth and, and the opportunities for more people to get into these construction opportunities and these local jobs. So I want to echo all the support and hope for your support on this agenda item. And thanks staff for, for their great work on this. Thank you. Our next speaker will be the person with the phone number ending in 702. Uh, and that person will be followed by Sal Espinoza. Hello, can you hello, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Good morning. My name is Matthew Edwards. I currently work for HMT Electric and I'm helping to rebuild the iconic Hotel Del Coronado. And I'm also an IB. W569 member. I'm also a black man who has been formerly incarcerated and can say that through the homework program and our partnership with the San Diego Union Trades have been openly welcomed into gaining meaningful employment and a career. And this CBA will help many disadvantaged men and women like myself, the over 2.3 million Americans who have been incarcerated. I strongly urge you to support this and know that it's going to give back to the community and produce thousands of jobs and boost the economy in San Diego. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, we have come to our final two speakers on this item that we're going to be able to take today. I just wanted to mention for those of you with your hands up still, uh, please do contact me at clerk of the board at sandag.org and I'll make sure that your comments are made part of the meeting record. Uh, so our final two commenters will be Sal Espinoza and Sal will be followed by Kelvin Barrios. Sal, your mic is open. You can start whenever you're ready. Uh, I think Sal's having some technical difficulties, so I'm going to move on to Kelvin Barrios. Uh, Kelvin, you can go ahead when you're ready. Good morning, Sandak Board of Directors. My name is Calvin Barrios. I am the Director of Government Affairs for Laborers Local 89, representing our business manager, Valentin Armacedo, and our nearly 4,000 members in San Diego County. I am calling in today to urge this board to be the first agency in San Diego County 
to sign a PLA for their capital programs. Let's make history. You have heard from my brothers and sisters in labor on the benefits of such agreement. I echo their comments and want to highlight that this community benefits agreement includes local hire provisions and provides quality health, family health, dental and retirement benefits for all construction workers. For many construction workers, these agreements will provide life-changing benefits for themselves and their families for the first time and create family, family legacies for generations to come. For these reasons and many others, I urge you today to vote for this community benefits agreement. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and Chair, that does conclude the list of public commenters. Okay, well, thank you so much to the public who came out today, um, called in and spoke. We really appreciate all of the feedback. Um, I see a number of hands up, um, and so I'm gonna call on you, um, Vice Chair Gloria. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you to all the members of the public who shared their thoughts with us this morning, and special thanks to our staff and the building trade partners who have worked hard, I think, uh, as was noted in the staff presentation for many months now, to respond to this board's direction and to bring this item back to us. Um, I would uh, point out that this item could not really come at a better time. Uh, last week, we worked together to approve a bold and transformational regional plan uh, that outlines $160 billion in investments in our region. And I wanna take this opportunity today with this uh, agenda item to make sure that those funds from the projects uh, that we're advancing stay in our community and support San Diego's working families. Um, I think it's uh, it's not just that the funding will benefit our region, uh, but the project labor agreements will provide a stable, properly chained local workforce that we can grow to create generations um, of uh, career trained um, folks who can help build the city, build the region. Um, the projects, uh, project labor agreement uh, will assist us in getting these projects delivered on time and on budget with quality construction, um, making sure that the limited public dollars that we have are going back into our local economy. All of us took great pride uh, in the completion of the Midcoast Trolley uh, project, uh, noting repeatedly all of us uh, that it was on time, on budget. Um, we can uh, do more of that uh, if with today's uh, agenda item. Um, based on the conversation uh, that we've had today and frankly, previous board items that touch on this issue, uh, it seems that some misunderstand what PLAs are. Uh, I think this is a commitment to only use uh, union labor. Uh, as the staff report lays out very clearly, uh, that is not the case. Open shop contractors can and do bid successfully for jobs governed by PLAs. Uh, it happens to be that projects built under PLAs are far less likely to have the cost and time overruns. I think all of us, regardless of party or ideology, are concerned about. Uh, at its core, a PLA is a performance contract, and I think we should demand uh, absolute highest levels of performance uh, from those who want to use our limited dollars to build things in our public rights of way. Uh, the contractors who get the billions of dollars in public funds uh, that ultimately we spend on these projects have to agree to an adequate supply of workers uh, with no work stoppages, as well as maintain the highest levels of skills and training uh, to make sure the work is done as quality. Uh, we avoid costly uh, errors and make sure that safety, of course, is always first and foremost. Uh, the natural result of these kinds of agreements is that we deliver projects on time, on budget, safely uh, and effectively for our community. I think all of us are here to do that. Uh, so when we're spending public money, Madam Chair, we should be uh, doing what we can uh, to go even further to make sure the benefits um, of these kinds of expenditures accrue to our local economy, to our local workers, to our local families. Um, I believe that that's exactly what this item will allow us to do. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of the work that has been done to get us to this vote today. Again, acknowledging it is no small lift. Um, and thank you to the staff and the presentation and everyone who's touched this particular issue. Um, I, this is an inclusive agreement, as has been said a couple of times now, gold standard. I think that's the level of expectation we should have as a board. Um, and I believe the end result of this is certainly helping way more San Diego working families. Uh, I'm proud that we uh, to move this item, Madam Chair. I ask for my colleagues' support for this agreement, um, and I appreciate the time this morning. Uh, again, move the staff recommendation. Totelo Solis, second. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Mayor Gasterland. Great, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this. Um, for me, this has been an important item to learn more about, and I, I've really taken a deep dive um, the community benefit agreement before us today is a thoughtful document, and I commend the energy and effort that has gone into crafting it. However, from my perspective, it needs more time to define clear goals, clear benefits, metrics to measure results, and consensus and support, especially among those who are intended to benefit. 
as we've heard in the public comment today. We need to be sure, does it help more than hurt? Does it help? There is no time urgent matter here. In the public comment, I hear hesitancy, uncertainty, and opposite interpretations of, of benefits to the community for the very same thing that is supposed to be a benefit. Um, this means more time is needed for all stakeholders to understand the goals and the benefits, to foresee any unintended consequences, and to avoid those unintended consequences. My perspective is as a scientist, an educator, and as a SANDAG board member, um, this is a social experiment. And an experiment needs goals, a baseline to compare against, and metrics to measure outcomes. Here, the baseline is business as, you, as usual, the way SANDAG does it now. What I haven't heard are questions like, what is broken or deficient? What can be improved? And I haven't heard these questions translate into tangible goals. Um, I read the 65 page agreement carefully and it's clear a primary goal is to include more targeted workers that is vulnerable and underrepresented populations and disadvantaged workers that is low income on construction teams and on projects. And I tell you from university experience, identifying these types of groups and making sure that they're targeted fairly and equitably is a tough thing to do. You need the metrics to understand what is being done. Another goal is to increase local workers rather than out of state or international workers on construction teams. So what's missing? The numbers are missing. Um, how many targeted workers are there now? How many disadvantaged? How will success be measured? How many out of state, for example, from Colorado workers are on construction teams now? How will success be measured? The metrics are missing. So without clear upfront data and without metrics to measure success, this agreement is incomplete. I urge that we step back and take the time needed to establish the goals, the benefits, consensus and support. I would like to see this be constructive, not divisive. I'd like to, I, I, let's take the time needed to reach out to all stakeholders. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Jones. Thank you so much. I actually could not agree more with Mayor Gasterland in her assessment of the situation. And, you know, when you look at who was actually involved in these negotiations, I don't believe there were any open shops that were um, that were part of these conversations. I feel like we've left them out. And, um, you know, it just in, um, you know, thinking about what we just approved last week, uh, the RTP, I do have a couple of questions. And um, so first is, were there any um, open shops that were part of that, that actually uh, hire uh, non-union and union workers? Were they part of these conversations? That would be my first question and staff can probably answer that. So we did have engagement with open shops. We did talk to several of the organizations that spoke today. So yes, we did have engagement with them. And were any of their um, their comments included into the agreement? Well, the biggest comment is that we are allowing state and federally approved apprenticeships, which means any type of apprenticeship that's state approved, such as the Black Contractors Association, AGC, ABC, they can all participate on our projects. But there is a certain amount of following up on that there are I think it's three per if I if I'm recalling this correctly three per trade uh, that would be available to be non-union and the rest have to be union workers and then those dollars that are gathered um, or paid to the actual um, uh, shops isn't there a certain percentage that would have to be like for instance if you had a uh, a worker that was making uh, $65 an hour, $20 of that would actually be paid to the union still and actually not going to the worker. Is that correct? So in terms of the fringe benefits payments that you're talking about, there are different programs that we have a carve out on. If you're a non-union and you're not a disadvantaged business, or a small business or a disabled veterans business, if you if you are within those three categories, those that 
we did a carve out so they have up to five core workers and also the fringe benefits will not be paid to the unions. So we have taken into consideration who needs to be helped on our projects. And these are the disadvantaged businesses and also our workers and our targeted workers that so support talk, those. So talk about the core workers. So they're not allowed to have all non-union employees. It would have to be a portion of, correct? So it just depends on how they allocate their core workers. And I do want to emphasize that if for some reason you go to the hiring hall and they don't have the core workers that you need, it goes back to the contractor and they would be able to hire their own, uh, you know, a targeted worker, a disadvantaged worker, et cetera. So there's all of these things that occur within at CBA. And that's why we do believe that we've covered almost all of the major areas that we need to um, actually provide programs for. So back to um, Masterlin's, you know, the I, I've reached out to several uh, general contractors uh, and I've asked them, what do they think about this uh, specifically? And does this uh, criteria help or does it hinder us? And uh, but they were what they told me is that it actually makes it impossible to use non union workers. So I, you know, I'm certainly not an expert in this. I don't profess to be an expert in this, but I know there are a lot of people that are um, experts in this. And I just feel like we haven't received the proper uh, feedback from them and uh, able to, you know, incorporate that into this agreement. And, you know, when I look at uh, San Diego County and I look at yeah, core workers the, and all that stuff. 270. Oh, that was another question that I have for staff. So would this action today um, add any cost to the new uh, $270 billion RTP that we just approved last week? So the CBA was not considered in project cost for the regional plan. But what we the way we see the cost, we in terms of a cost increase, there will be a cost increase to administrate the CBA. But what we see this as is an investment, an investment in increasing the number of targeted workers, disadvantaged workers, disadvantaged businesses that can work on our projects. Because right now, we don't have a program that does this. And this will enable us to have that agreement with our contractors that this is first and foremost very important to Sandeg. Now, in terms of increasing the cost of a project, that is very difficult to determine because, you know, depending on the scope of work of a project, where it's being built, the timing of where it's being built, it's not really feasible at this time to tell you, yes, we're going to we're going to project an increase in cost. We won't know that until we actually have the CBA implemented and we're working on it. Yeah, just uh, to, to add, if I may, Chair, uh, to uh, Elaine's question to Mayor, um, to the Mayor, uh, Mayor Jones, uh, you authorize us to negotiate, uh, and we did that. And uh, trust me, that what you have in front of you uh, uh, took a lot of work. And I am proud to say, this is probably the only PLA in the state that is totally inclusive. It does not exclude anybody. Uh, all federally, state, uh, federally and state approved the partnership is part of this. This PLA, and, and I'm proud to say that uh, I've been part of many PLAs, this is by far uh, fair. Um, as, as to your question to the RTP cost, uh, like Elaine said, it's hard to predetermine, but I can tell you this brings certainty and equality to the work that we're gonna do in the RTP. And I'm sure we will we'll find out as we move forward. But I believe this is a good thing for San Diego County. I believe it's actually surprising that uh, Sandag, with what it does, didn't have a, a PLA, a, a community agreement uh, so far. But we did, in the negotiation, made sure that this is an inclusive and this is good for San Diego. As to Mayor Castron and questions, you know, to, to have case studies, we have to go into this many times. This is the first time that this agency does that. Uh, I would love to build uh, 
a situation where we have case studies and, and come back to you and say here what we found. Uh, I appreciate the comment, but I want to assure you that this is, a, and I will challenge anybody to tell me in the state of California or anywhere, there is a more inclusive PLE, a more fair PLE. And like Mary Gloria said, this is about um, creating um, equal opportunities for, for our residents, all uh, 3.3 million of them. So based on a lot of the conversation that has happened today, I don't feel like we're there yet, really feeling like it's inclusive. I feel like we're jumping the gun. And uh, to Mayor Gasterlin's point, and um, also something that I brought earlier, and that is um, we don't have the metrics. We don't even have, I mean, I, I asked it earlier, where are we at as far as local um, uh, um, uh, workers? Where are we at today? We're at about 50 to 50%, it was said. And we have no idea what our actual projections are going to be taking this action today. I have a real problem with that. I want union workers to have opportunity and I want non-union workers to have opportunity. If we're going to make statements that we are inclusive of everyone, we need to have the data to prove that. And I just don't feel like we're there yet. I, I, I will make a motion, a substitute motion, that we put this off for 90 days and bring all workers that are representing non-union and union workers to the table so that we are being inclusive as possible to have as many opportunities for our workers in San Diego County for everyone and that we can actually come up with criteria that does not uh, leave anyone out. Um, I'm a proponent of everyone having a job and um, I just, I'm really concerned with uh, some of the things that have been brought up by many of our partners here uh, today that are uh, representative of new, uh, union and non-union shops. I just think we need to have that uh, information as part of this and uh, part of the negotiations. Mayor so, Jones, so you have a motion. So let's see if there's a second for it. Yeah. Mayor um, Gasterlin, I second the motion and I'd like to call the vote. Okay. Well, we're going to, um, well, let me ask the attorney, Do with 10 hands up, do we go to the substitute motion first or do we go to the- board Once the substitute vote? motion is on the table, it is, uh, it is open for a vote. Once comments are over, I believe that Mayor Gasterland has uh, called for the vote. That effectively is a motion to end debate and that requires a, uh, a two thirds majority to pass. Okay, well, how about this? Okay, I'll, so, I'll, I'll, re I'll retract my call. Um, I will be leaving the meeting at noon, unfortunately. We have an emergency in Del Mar that I have to attend to. Okay. Okay, Let, let's, let's, I would like to encourage my colleagues to not ask a back and forth of questions with staff to do that offline and to state your comments and then, and then get, and then we'll get to these votes and try to do them before we start to lose our board members. So um, I'm going to call on um, Mayor Hebner now. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm in favor of this CDA. I, I really think that it's the result of uh, very good planning and is good planning on our behalf to ensure that we have the labor force that we need to do all of these projects that are coming forth. And we would have, that labor force is going to be trained and skilled, and it's going to provide careers to union and non-union workers. From what I've heard, we did have them all at the table and um, discuss this in this, what I consider a very inclusive agreement. I like that it's increasing the opportunities to the disadvantaged and vulnerable populations um, that we've talked about already. Um, I also am really pleased that this is a, a commitment to our equity statement and it will result in real life improvements to people's lives, to their pocketbooks, to their, their pride, their sense of self-worth. Um, and it's not just a, a job, but it's a, a career. Um, I also think that this is more of a solution to the housing crisis that we have than many of the things that we've been talking about over the years, because um, housing crisis is most likely due more to uh, wages not keeping up and um, waning opportunities. And so I think that this is going to help many a pe person, many a family um, be able to earn their way into a home. Um, finally, uh, many of our speakers shared their personal stories, which brought home to me the societal benefits of this CBA as well by providing them career opportunities and those people who had difficulties gaining them otherwise. So I am in favor of the CBA and the original motion. Okay, thank you. Mayor Vasquez.
Uh, thank you so very much. I will cut what I wanted to, to share with everyone in half today. But what I'd like to say is this community benefits agreement is the most inclusive and most equitable agreement possible with all associations and groups um, included in the conversation. And this, this agreement will provide each and every group to, an opportunity to participate in SANDAG's work. Again, that includes all approved state and federal apprenticeship programs. Um, the Community Benefits Agreement will create new job opportunities for those uh, who work in the construction industry. This will provide an opportunity for local families, including those who live in the city of Lemon Grove, like Derek Phillips, uh, to pay their rent or mortgage and to put food on their tables. So I am supportive of moving this agreement forward. And just note that supporting this CBA is not the end. It is the beginning of our ability to uphold the equity statement. So uh, thank you, Sandag staff, and to each and every organization involved, uh, but also the public for working together to develop the most inclusive and equitable equitable agreement possible. That concludes my comments. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the vote on the substitute motion and then the motion and people can make their comments afterward if they want to be on the record. But uh, we are gonna be losing a large number of board members. So I'd like to go to the substitute motion now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, staff is putting the motion up on the screen for reference. Okay. Wait, I can do it for you, just. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, for the city of Carlsbad, Mayor Hall? Yes. For the city of Chula Vista, Mayor Salas? No. For the city of Coronado, Mayor Bailey? Yes. For the county of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer? No. For the city of Del Mar, Mayor Gasterland? Yes. For the city of El Cajon, Mayor Wells? Yes. For the city of Encinitas, Chair Blakespear? No. For the city of Escondido, Mayor McNamara? No. For the city of Imperial Beach, Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs? No. For the city of La Mesa, Council Member Shu? No. For the city of Lemon Grove, Mayor Vasquez? No. For the city of National City, Second Vice Chair Sotelo Solis? Sotelo Solis, nay. Thank you. Okay. For the city of Oceanside, Council Member Rodriguez? Yes. For the city of Poway, Mayor Voss? Yes. For the city of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria? No. For the city of San Marcos, Mayor Jones? Jones, yes. Thank you. For the city of Santee, Mayor Minto? I'm gonna come back to Mayor Minto. For the city of Solana Beach, Mayor Hebner? Hebner, no. Thank you. And for the city of Vista, Mayor Ritter? Vista, yes. Thank you. And for the city of Santee? Minto, no. Thank you, Mayor Minto. And that motion does not pass. Okay, let's go to the original motion now. Well, hold on. We still have speakers on. I, I want to speak before we go to the original motion. I think we're, we're, we need to go to the original motion so that we don't lose a quorum. And we just did the substitute. We're not going to lose a quorum. How are we going to lose a quorum? Let's go through and see who's leaving. We have more people on the board that want to speak. I know. And we can speak after the motion. But that's why we took the substitute motion. I mean, in part, Mayor Gastelin said she had to leave and others have communicated to staff that they're leaving. So we, we, we can make well, can, our Can we do a count of who's leaving? Because you know, we've all been waiting patiently to speak and we should be able to speak before we make such an important decision. And I would ask what the attorney says. Okay, John. We should allow comments. Um, they can certainly be encouraged to be brief. Okay, um, go ahead, Councilmember Rodriguez. 
Thank you very much. I'll be as brief as possible. What, what we have uh, before us today is not a community benefits agreement. It's a funding mechanism, a funding arm for the regional plan that we just approved, the, the, the plan that we don't have funding sources for. It's to help fund the unions so that they can fund the political outreach to approve a future tax measure uh, and measures to include a potential road user charge. It's also to fund the individuals who supported the regional plan. When you wanna be inclusive, you create a wide and open pathway, a wide and open door. When you do not wanna be inclusive, you make that door very thin and small. So you gotta get in line. You gotta, you gotta pay your bills. You gotta pay the dues to get, on, to get on the game plan. This is a disaster and it will be a battle against the labor unions and the Democrats that approved this last meeting at the ballot box. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor Hall. Yes, um, I, I just wanna say thank you to all the speakers. We understand your positions and you are very well spoken. Um, obviously with everything we do, there's a cost. And the fact that we did uh, approve the plan last week and knowing that there is a cost to PLAs, how much will this increase our our budget towards the five big moves? Am I ready? Okay. Yes, Mayor. I'll, I'll take this. As 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 okay. the staff said earlier, we would not know what would that do. But what that does is create careers. It benefits the disadvantaged. It benefits low-income and minorities that otherwise won't. What this does is, I believe, Council President uh, Rivera mentioned, what this does is assume a fairness in our work. And therefore- yeah, So, Hassan, excuse me, I'd like to interrupt you. We don't need an argument for it. Yeah. I'd just like to ask the board members to make their quick comments and sure. let's move forward. So go ahead, Mayor Hall. Well, I didn't hear the answer. Obviously, I think, I think they don't know. Isn't that what oh, that staff? can't be? That can't be 163 billion, and you don't realize what your labor costs are. Come on, I mean, so that's a fair so question. Yes, yeah, so so answer that specific question, please. The, so, the cost of the RTP that you just approved last week does not factor in any increased cost due to labor agreement, and there is no way possible in the world to know what that cost is either increase or decrease until we start looking at how this is gonna be implemented. So, so some of us have done big projects in the past and we understand the cost of project labor and grievance and they're anywhere from 13 and a half percent to 25%. I mean, that's pretty well understood and there's been multiple studies done here in the county to back up that statement. So when you're take, taking 163 billion you know, a, a big percentage of this is going to be labor. And so at the end of the day, what, what we're voting on today, at a minimum, is five to $10 billion increase by the numbers that I've used. And I've tried to use the most conservative numbers. And I'd wish you'd use the number. And I think part of being honest and transparent is making sure that the residents and the citizens know and understand that. And so I, I wish you would have ans answered the question. I, I gave you the question prior to this meeting so you could be prepared and I'm sorry you couldn't answer it. I also would like everyone who, is, who has been part of today's meeting, if you look at 4.6, um, that really dictates how many people are actually gonna have to come from outside of the county um, to, meet, to meet the numbers. If you look at 4.9, you'll see how much that is also going to increase the cost of, of what we're doing. And if you look at 6.2, it'll speak to wage theft. So I'm not going to go into each one of those. It's in your report. And I appreciate, I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Mayor Sotelis Elise. Thank you so much, Chair. Can you hear me? I'm on my phone. And the, okay. Yes, uh, so I'm very, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm very proud to have seconded the motion on the floor and to move forward item 14, the community benefits and project labor agreements. Let me just tell you why. 
This is about equity. And, and re let me remind our colleagues, you know, uh, they talk about the timing and, oh, we haven't had enough time, but it started back February 12th of this year where our board voted to approve the SANDAG commitment to equity. And guess what? It was brought up that it was Democrats didn't vote in support. Well, there were Republicans that didn't vote in support of that. But you know what? We stood together because we wanted to move forward and say equity was important. April 9th, the board adopted a resolution to direct staff to consider a PLA. And July 23rd, the board authorized staff to begin CBA negotiations with the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades uh, Council. And today we have the birth of all of that. It's essential that at the end of the day, we stop talking about things as others, but the people that are working and doing the labor are our constituents. They're the ones we see at the grocery store. They are the ones who have their kids in the same dance class. They are the ones that are doing and have their you know, dentist appointments right where we do. So we really need to take that othering off and out of our uh, dialect. This is inclusive of both union and non-union contractors. It includes workforce opportunities for rising careers uh, in the program initiatives. It is inclusive of all state and federally approved apprenticeship programs. Additional flexibility for disadvantaged businesses hiring um, and hiring and benefit contributions and high reaching goals for disadvantaged and targeting worker employment. This focuses on obtaining workers for low income populations. So people who wanna say, oh, I'm caring and I'm working for all people, but we need more time to talk about it. It's about action, let's do it. This is our opportunity to make that happen. Don't drag your feet. Don't say you're an advocate or a champion or wanting more information. This is how we get it done. This is a time. And so again, it sets the 30% disadvantaged worker program goal on covered project, identifies workers by utilizing predetermined low income zip code lists locally and nationally. It establishes a project radius for local and pre-approved federal contracts and includes veterans. So those that have uh, high veteran population, this is going to benefit your constituency. This is why we do it. I'm very proud to be from a union household. My tata, Teamster. My abuelo, uh, Laborers Local 89. My tia, United Farm Worker. And my sisters, all teachers. This is about three potential generations of jobs for our community. Don't drag your feet. Don't say you're advocating. You need more time. This is about doing it now. A PLA, also referred to as a community benefits agreement, focuses on a workforce equity component with equity components that create economic benefits for the community. Let's do this, hermanos. This is the time. Vote yes on um, item 14. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we're trying to um, get to the vote here. So Supervisor Lawson Reamer and then Council Member Ella Rivera. We can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I just first just really wanna thank um, staff for their extraordinary yeah. work. Uh, this was a huge effort and I think you've done a really tremendous job of putting together a community benefit agreement that's incredibly inclusive, um, that does uh, excellent job of targeting diverse and inclusive communities and is going to be a real step forward um, to raising the boat for everyone in San Diego. I think uh, one a core principle when we think about spending public money is that public money needs to be spent for a public benefit. And um, at, at the center of that is making sure that when we are building um, major projects in our region, that they are generating good jobs for working families and raising all boats. Um, I was really moved in the testimony, uh, the public testimony, um, uh, by the, uh, the story of a, the single mom who went through an apprenticeship program and is now has a good job. Um, and as a single mom myself, I understand how important it is to be able to uh, count on uh, good jobs with benefits to put uh, food on the table for our families and a roof over the, our heads uh, for our children. Um, so I just, again, I can't uh, tell you how proud I am um, that our 
organization, Sandag, has put this together and brought this forward to a vote for us. Um, um, we'd be very proud to support this today. Um, there's a really um, valuable precedent in our region of uh, school bonds that were built with uh, agreements similar to this one, as well as uh, the transit system in LA that were built with agreements similar to this one. But this is even better, uh, one step further in ensuring that um, we're including and targeting all disadvantaged communities. Um, and uh, there's also uh, quite a bit of good data that shows that uh, projects uh, tend to be completed on time and in budget with much more reliability and frequency when you have agreements like these um, to ensure accountability on the contractor side, as well as um, good data to show that investments that are uh, governed by community benefit agreements like this one are lead to much uh, greater improvements in the well-being and the incomes of people in the community. Uh, so uh, looking at the economic data historically and over time, um, and listening to all the diverse voices that showed up in support. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for your hard work and I'll be very uh, proud to support this motion today. Okay, thank you. Council President and then Council Member Shu will go after the vote. Thank you so much for volunteering to do that. Okay, go, go ahead, Council President. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. I just, uh, especially because Supervisor Lawson Reamer just mentioned a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, I just wanted to, to uh, um, address some of the concerns that have been raised. Community benefit agreements, PLAs, are not radically new concepts. Well, we are behind the times by not having one here in San Diego. Uh, this is this is a way of providing certainty. Uh, it's a way of, of certainty with respect to cost. And I will go back to the question that I asked earlier, having come from the community college and workforce development side of things. This agreement with the regional tra transportation plan in place will allow educators, uh, apprenticeship programs, and others to start doing the recruitment necessary to ensure that young San Diegans, San Diegans who are exiting uh, exiting the, the justice system, those who have been intentionally left out of employment opportunities will have not just good jobs, but family and life-changing career opportunities. Uh, this is a great, great step forward. I am incredibly grateful of the really, really hard work uh, that Sandag staff and board members did to get it to this point. Uh, if a weighted vote is needed, I will be proudly casting one in support of this. A uh, great job. And again, this is not just a good thing to do, it is a responsible thing to do that will provide certainty with respect to cost. None of those, those anti-worker talking points about this adding cost are true. This is a good, good thing to do. Okay, thank you. So let's go to the vote. And then if you can stick around and listen to your other board member comments, that would be appreciated. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the City of Carlsbad, Mayor Hall. For the City of Chula Vista, Chula Vista Mayor Salas. Sorry, I'm not Thanks. sure what's happening. <laughs> Thank yes. you very much. Aye. Wait, did we get Mayor Hall's vote? I didn't hear. I didn't. No, um, I'm going to come back for Mayor Hall in just a moment. Um, I'm just gonna start back at the top. For the city of Carlsbad, Mayor Hall? No. Thank you. For the city of Chula Vista, Mayor Salas? Yes, indeed. Thank you. For the city of Coronado, Council Member Donovan? No. Thank you. For the county of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Yes. Thank you. For the city of Del Mar, Mayor Gasterland? I will come back to the city of Del Mar. Uh, for the city of El Cajon, Mayor Wells? No. Thank you. For the city of Encinitas, Chair Blakespear? Yes. Thank you. For the city of Escondido, Mayor McNamara? Yes. For the city of Imperial Beach, Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs? Yes. Thank you. For the city of La Mesa, Council Member Shu? Yes. For the city of Lemon Grove, Mayor Vasquez? Yes. For the city of National City, Second Vice Chair Sotelo Solis? Sotelo Solis, aye. Thank you for the city of Oceanside, Council Member Rodriguez. No. Thank you for the city of Poway, Mayor Voss. No. Thank you for the city of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria. Yes. Thank you for the city of San Marcos, Mayor Jones. No. Thank you for the city of Santee, Mayor Minto. Minto, no. Thank you for the city of Solana Beach, Mayor Hebner. Hebner, yes. Thank you for the city of Vista, Mayor Ritter. I will come back for the city of Vista in just a moment. Uh, for the city of Del Mar, do we have Mayor Gasterland? 
All right, the city of Del Mar is absent. Uh, for the city of Vista, uh, do we have Meritor? No. The city of Vista is also absent. And that item does pass with those members present. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now I'll call on council member Shu. Thank you for um, all the comments I, I've heard. I just wanted to make a few comments uh, with this regard to this item. You know, one way to think about uh, project labor agreements or community benefit agreements is to think about what life was like, what our communities were like, what our, what our workers were suffering prior to having these kinds of agreements. Uh, we had people coming from way out of state, uh, not qualified to do these jobs, work on them. Uh, we had many people in our community uh, not getting the kind of training they needed. And we had people um, that were actually uh, quite, uh, uh, I guess, uh, taking advantage of this situation of, of government jobs and um, not doing right to our own communities. With regards to costs, I'm happy to pay a little bit more if it means that we have a better trained workforce for the future. And sometimes these costs are elevated not because of workers, but because of greedy contractors uh, that benefit from project changes and really uh, take more money from the government. Uh, so I, I think I really want to side with the workers more so than contractors. With regards to um, many of the comments we heard from various um, minority groups within our community, let's remember that our workforce here in La Mesa and in, in, in our region, uh, our uh, labor groups are very inclusive. They're very diverse. We benefit from that. That wasn't that way in, in decades past in our country's history. But in San Diego, our workforce, our labor groups uh, are diverse, that they are inclusive. Um, so to that degree, I, I really want to support them. So I'm so happy that we passed this measure uh, because I think it is uh, better for us. Just think of what life was like without unions, what life, what our workforce was like uh, without unions and labor groups. So I think we're really moving ahead, thank you. Thank you for those comments. I think that's a great historic perspective to add. Um, and it is really worth reflecting on that because there is very much the middle class is created by unions. Um, and you see that when you see the historic data and the trends about what, how, what people earn and um, how they can support themselves on that. Uh, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I wanna make sure that any other board members who wanted to comment had a chance to do that. So, and for those of you who cut it short, thank you for doing that so we could get to the vote before we lost a quorum. Okay, um, I don't see anybody else. So we're going to skip the last item on our agenda and push that forward, that's item 15. Um, and let's see, what else? Any non-agenda member comments on any topic? No, don't see any. Okay, so our, um, our next meeting is scheduled for Friday, January 14 at 9 a.m. And happy holidays, everybody. I hope you enjoy it with your family and we will see you in the new year. Thank you. We are a